back one year to ASA's version of spring training when 38 short track superstars took their cuts at Lakeland, Florida in the season opener. It was a night where wily veterans came out throwing heat. And some fearless rookies responded with some hard line drives of their own. There were plenty of hits, singles, doubles, triples, and even more. There were costly errors and even a bench clearing brawl. But when the smoke cleared, it was veteran Butch Miller taking the curtain call in a night that set the tone for a season long championship chase. And it's time to play ball as ASA returns live to speed. Welcome to Lakeland in Central Florida for the SK Hand Tool 200 at USA International Speedway. It's the opening round of the American Speed Association's 37th remarkable season of building champions. Now, there's a buzz and energy about this season. One reason because some of the new venues we'll be going to, but another is because of a new look for the machines themselves. The savvy marketing people with ASA have elected to move the numbers back to the rear quarter panel, freeing up that huge door where the numbers usually are for sponsor exposure. Let's go down now to Ken Stout with our defending champion. Our reigning champ, Kevin Sawinski from the 2003 season, put his name on a very short list of just seven by winning multiple championships. This year, he'll look to put his name on an even shorter list of four by winning back-to-back -back championships. Kevin, how do you maintain that consistency? You do it with teamwork, for sure, and uh, I was very fortunate to keep everybody in the same slot on the team, and we're looking to do it again this year. The man that chased him all last year was Butch Miller. He had three wins and three poles. This year, he'd like to get past him. To my colleague, Rob Albright. Much has been made of the spectacular rookie crop, and rightly so, but the veterans are back in full force as well. And one is back after several years of absence, the 1999 champion, Tim Sauter. Tim, are you as glad to be back as we are? Happy to have you back. Yeah, I'm really happy to be back. The ASA series is growing. It's super competitive. I've got a great sponsor with Lester Buildings and uh, Don and Marilyn Finetti. So uh, we're looking forward to a good race and a good season. Tim will start from the 15th position. Another champion is also gracing the field tonight. Brian Rector, the 1995 titles with a brand new crew chief will start 22nd, Greg. Thanks very much, Rob. And more than willing to take on those veterans are the rookies who showed themselves so impressively last year. Reed Sorensen, Rookie of the Year. Travis Kittleson, a close second to him in the points. And Davin Seitz, although he's not here, the only rookie last year to actually get a win. He will be a factor throughout most of the season. But Jim Trado, as Rob Albright alluded to, the rookie crop for 04, spectacular. Boy, and they came out hungry. 13 drivers, registered rookies, made the field today, and they are not shy about qualifying. They're up front in the grid. They're also up front to challenge the best short track racers in America. Here in ASA starts tonight, the season for the 50 grand rookie of the year titles on the line. It is going to be spectacular. Now, one of the rookies this year actually raced here last year, and without a doubt, last year, he made a big splash. <laughs> rookie half of the country Joe racing team is Joey Miller and last year at this race Joey qualified on the outside of the front row but it coming together with Reed Sorensen sent him crashing and splashing down the Lakeland front straight away Joey's an early pick for rookie of the year but his stunning speed usually comes at a cost veteran crew chief Bon us has been working with a kid all last year and now they've instituted a new plan to keep him out of trouble tell us about it Joey well, we got an incentive program for my spotter now. If I finish the race, he gets a little bonus, and hopefully when we finish, we can make some money to pay him. Hopefully that pays off for the man upstairs to my colleague, Rob Albright. One of the more colorful and creative paint schemes belongs to rookie driver Scott Legacy. I asked Scott where it came from. He said he likes this Malibu boat, and he painted it to match that. Scotty, the fellow drivers on pit road say that you are the young man to beat for rookie of the year this season. Is that an extra load for you to bear? Not at all, Rob. We're here to uh, focus on winning races, and let's see how it ends up. But I'm excited about this year and can't wait to get it going. Scott nearly won this race in a limited schedule last season. He may be a challenger again tonight, guys. Well, he's a wakeboarding freak, so the Marine Connection, perhaps no fluke. It's time now to go trackside for that coveted command with Michelle Moulin of SK Hand Tools. On behalf of SK Hand Tools, it's uh, hundreds of employees and its partners all over the world. Gentlemen, start your engine!
As a huge field fires up and comes to life, we are just about ready to get not only the SK Hand Tool 200 underway, but the 04 ASA Racing Series National Tour underway here in Lakeland. One of ASA's favorite former competitors, Scott Fraser of Nova Scotia, recently lost his life in a non-racing related accident. The entire ASA community offers its thoughts and condolences to Scott's family and friends. Speed Channel's live coverage of the ASA Racing Series SK Hand Tool 200 is being brought to you by SK Hand Tool, professional tool since 1921. By BF Goodrich Tires, the official tire of ASA. And by Odor Eaters. Put Odor Eaters in, kick foot odor and wetness out. And welcome back, everybody. As you can see, well underway with the pace and parade laps. And it is a huge field, so 40 cars strong. And let's take a look at that starting lineup. Zach Niesner, what a story. Up front, the young rookie at 124.79 miles per hour. But the question that we had to ask this young man is, are you surprised to run that fast in snare pole? Yeah, you know, starting up front like this is a huge surprise for me. Uh, we weren't that good in final practice. Um, who knows if we got a good long run car, but it went fast for one lap, and right now that's uh, that's what I'm happy about. We'll see after 200, and uh, hopefully get a top 10. We'll be happy. Let's move to rows three and four. Travis Kittleson, the rookie Joey Miller, Mike Garvey, and Mike Cope. Interesting story for Mike Cope. A horrible, really, season by his standards last year. Great qualifying. Is this a sign of a reborn season? We got a new crew chief in Del Burns, new chassis with left-hander stuff. Still got our Port City cars, but we're, you know, we expected to run real well. We struggled a little bit early on, but a good qualifying effort, and uh, you, you, you can expect more of this. Moving to rows five and six, you see reigning champ Kevin Sawinski in 10th, Foster, the very quick Legacy in 12th. Row seven and eight, Doug Stevens, Butch Miller back in 14th. 99 champ Tim Sauter with him and Tim Russell. How about ninth and 10th rows? Smith, Brown, Robbie Pyle back in 19th and Greg Stewart. Then we go to rows 11 and 12 and there is Reed Sorensen, the rookie of the year. Now Sorensen actually was fastest in one of the practice sessions, always near the front. Why then in qualifying is he so far back? <laughs> We had a fuel pressure problem with our primary car and had to go to the backup and uh, I know we weren't quite ready to go out there with it and it was, it was all right and uh, we may pull out a line, make some adjustments on it and uh, try to get ready for the race. Hopefully we'll make it to the front. He's definitely got his work cut out. Rows 13 and 14, Henderson, Locke, Beebe and Jones. Rows 15 and 16, Middleton, Sherman, Chris Stump and Travis Dassau. Now we take a look at rows 17 and 18, Jason Rudd, nephew to Ricky Rudd and the Scotsman, John Dial. And in the back, Peter Casolino, two wins last year and he ends up needing a provisional to make the field. Absolutely a surprise there. This track, really a great racing facility. And Jim Trado, give us a little bit of a look at USA International. Well, I say it's a paperclip oval because it has long straightaways and tight corners, but the guys love it because they, they can let it out on the straightaways here, our big uh, 0.750 three-quarter mile track, one of the bigger tracks they run. 14 degree banking in the corner, so it's plenty quick, no question. Let's take a look now at our race analysis. We are going 200 laps, 150 miles, big field, over $200,000 at first, and the pit window is 75 laps. So we can get a lot of racing in here, certainly before these cars have to go. Now let's take a look at our in-car cameras. First of all, we are going to be on board with the 99 champ, number nine, Tim Sauter, the Lester Buildings Ford, back in the 15th starting spot. Watch him charge. Then we'll be on board with number 17, Mike Garvey, the pole sitter here last year in the Janet King, in the Anna King Chevy, and he only was able to qualify seventh. And then we go up to Joey Miller, number 15, the Great Cliff Chevy, qualified sixth this year. But we do expect Joey Miller to be spectacular, but certainly incredibly fast. Let's get back down to pit lane for a last minute story first with Ken Stout. You know, Greg, we talked about brakes here a little bit. I talked to some of the guys, one being Kevin Sawinski. I said his brakes going to be an issue here at a big braking track. He said he doesn't think so. The sun's gone down. The temperatures are cooling off. He thinks everything's going to be just fine. Let's go to Rob. You know, we've got a great starting field tonight, but one guy very glaringly absent this evening. We'd like to say hello to him. Hopefully he's watching. Gary St. Amant, the all-time ASA money winner. He's third in starts. He's fourth in laps led. He's sixth in pole positions and seventh in ASA history in race wins. He's chosen to do something a little bit different this season. Gary will be greatly missed, guys. 
Absolutely. In fact, talked to Gary a little bit earlier today, and he said he'll be watching. So, hi, Gary. Uh, you're definitely going to be missed. You know, he's doing a little practicing for the series he's running at Mansfield tonight. And uh, tell you what, Jim, I'm excited. Uh, you know, we talked about what's going to be happening this year is going to be absolutely spectacular. And we've been waiting a long time for this to unfold. Let's get back down to Ken. What's up? got a little story here for you guys. Peter Cozzolino had some problems. In fact, he's been put on probation already. He went out to qualify with a ride block, still stuck in the rear end. Well, of course, they penalized him, but maybe it's not a bad thing. If you recall IRP last year, he won from last place, so maybe it'll work out for him. Let's go to Rob. Pyle starts way back, Robbie Pyle, way back in the 19th position tonight. His worst starting spot in the entire 2003 campaign was eighth. So he's got his work cut out for him. He was not at all worried. He said we had a better car. They went out early. The track was hot. It was greasy. Watch for him to come to the front early, guys. Well, that was one of the conditions. They qualified when it was much warmer. Some of these rookies, as they went out, the track cooled because of some cloud cover, and it paid off huge. Pace car is in. We're about ready to get underway with the 2004 ASA National Series season coming up, and we are green. Keep in mind now, watch for the outside. That is the young man, Stephen Light, 17 years old, on the left or the right side, if you will, of our pole qualifier, Zach Niesner. And uh, tell you what, Niesner right now sort of slides into the lead. Pretty smart move by Stephen Light not to race that early. Well, both drivers had a taste of ASA last year. Stephen Light actually ran up front for the majority of the early portion of this race one year ago. He decided to forego a rookie effort to put a full emphasis on the full season this year. So they both have lap, uh, lap times here. Zach Niesner just in practice with Stephen Light on his experience one year ago. Good look right here. That is the blue brake clips, number 15 of Joey Miller, the Chevrolet, but working the outside. Mike Koki hop on board with Tim Sauter, the number nine Ford, sponsored by Lester Buildings. And uh, tell you what, I was watching in practice of qualifying. His speed going into corners was absolutely phenomenal. Obviously, with his qualifying run, a little tough to get out of the turns, and he's got to work through that. Big pop move right there by the number 96 of Wade Day. Bit of a surprise with his qualifying effort. But Wade Day, again, only just two starts of the year, just two years ago, he ran the Dash Series in Daytona. He's been a stand out in the Tennessee area, teaming up with Bob Harshberger. These guys may be doing something here in this brand new race car. And sitting right there in the four spot, that yellow Terry's Automotive Group machine, that is the Dodge of Brett Sontag. And uh, no doubt, Ken Stout, his run was spectacular in qualifying. They put on board here for this season, Chad Orr. Keep in mind, Chad Orr worked underneath Bob Suss back in 02 when they won the championship with Joey Clint. He also worked a little bit with Terry's Motorsports last year at Elko, did a great job. And of course, he brought Gary St. Amon to his best finish of the 03 season. They're looking to do a great job here in 04. He is very quick and surprised everybody with a blistering qualifying run that at the time put him at the top of the sheets. Right now, he is trying to get down and underneath the number four of Stephen Light. And I think that's a great story as well. The Walton program, almost last minute, decided to bring together a second car. And boy, did they get a guy to crew that. Walton Racing is the team that Robbie Pyle has been racing with in ASA. They wanted to make a rookie effort this year. They brought in Howie Leno, who's coached and won seven rookie of the year titles here in ASA and a series championship with Tony Rain. So a great pairing there. Stephen Light paying off with an outside front row starting spot and remaining up front that red number four. Oh, big loose moment. And that was the 71 of Sontag. I don't know whether he got tagged a little bit or whether he did that on his own, but it definitely cost him. That is the defending champ right there, the red Country Joe's Holmes machine. That is, uh, he's really trying to tuck in behind him. Right behind him is Scott Legacy. Right now, it's just an absolute mind-blowing shame to me that Legacy does not have a big sponsor on that door. This guy is so impressive. Legacy out of Florida, certainly one to watch as he made his way through the field last year and was a contender for a top five run late in the race. Right now, Zach Niesner is actually starting to draw away in the YokeTV.com car. And Rob Albright, uh, he looks awfully strong early. He does, Greg, and for very good reason. You mentioned at the top of the show he was running for rookie of the year. Well, he told me that this uh, Wood Brothers automobile, it's a one race at a time deal. So every time he gets behind the wheel of the car, he's got to show everything he's got. He's got to get TV time and do his best. Now, he's also got a rookie chief crew chief in Ryan Bergenstead. So these two rookie drivers really with something to prove in this opening event tonight. 
And of course, uh, if, if it's a race by race deal, obviously anytime you can run at the front and even win, he's bringing in a little bit of that purse money to maybe help fund him and get him to the next race. Boy, talk about some pressure. Here's your top 10 very early on here at Lakeland in the SKN Tool 200. Well, now it is revealed to me, Jim, why it was so tough to find you for much of the afternoon and early evening. That looks good. Really good. We are under caution, by the way, and uh, this is the culprit, number 21, Jimmy Henderson, the m and Mortgage Chevy. Just got away from him all by himself and brought it out very, very early in the going. But what it does do is give us an opportunity to explain one of the new rules that's been implemented this year for the restarts and uh, sort of generically being referred to as the choose rule. Well, ASA Racing Series has always been worried about, you know, let's make this competition good enough for the guys to really show their skills. Well, what they've done to make it a little more exciting this year, ASA has called the choose rule. Any restart at every restart will be a double file restart. And as the leader crosses the finish line on the designated lap, he chooses whether he wants to restart the race on the inside or the outside group. The car right behind him has that same choice. They can start behind the race leader or pull up even. What we may see is drivers all forming in line behind the behind the race leader, four or five, six places back. But seventh place, if he decides to go to the outside, he will line up outside of the race leader on the restart. So ultimately, he may gain four or five positions by choosing the outside line. And in this case, the track generally is considered much quicker on the inside line. So that's a big, whoa, we've got, that that's is Tim Sauter. And he's got a serious problem. The, uh, something has compressed on that right front suspension, and he's heading down into pit lane. So we'll keep an eye on that. But as I said, it's, it's a serious gamble sometimes. But if you're well back, why not? He's coming down the pits. Uh-oh, and Todd Cleaver, who's had nothing but problems, even on the way here, Jim, looks like he's going behind the wall. Let's check in with Rob Albright on Todd. Well, I'll tell you, Todd has really struggled, as you guys documented earlier, with the incident on their way to the racetrack. They apparently have burned up the clutch in car number 55, and that will take them out for some time, if not for the entire evening. So a very disappointing end to a very frustrating week for Todd Cleaver, Bob Cumbo, and his folks. Guys. Wow, that just terrible to see with the effort that they put in. Now we're taking a look at what's going on with Sauter, and the tire and wheel look good, Jim. That is the tire that came off the right front. The BF Goodrich Traction TA is still inflated. When the car came in, it looked like there was a suspension failure, perhaps the upper AM or something along that line. The, the top of the wheel was towed way in, so when he came down pit road, he was sparking because the frame of the car itself was hitting the racetrack. Well, either way, it is going to be a very long stop, one fears, for our 99 champ, Tim Sauter. And uh, here you go. They are making the move, and you can see some of the cars popping to the outside. 42 is your leader, Niesner. First guy to go outside is Mike Cope, and that is an interesting move by Mike. Let's get back down to Ken Stout. What's going on with Tim Sauter? Well, obviously, problems with the front end, guys. I can't really see what it is. If it's a sway bar, if it's a tie rod, something very, very loose underneath there, the right front off. They're working frantically, obviously, to get the former champ back out and into action, but this will cost him a lot of very, a very lot of time. Back up to the guys. Well, of course, he's in this for the whole season, and he was hoping to maybe take a run and get his second championship. That's going to be tough indeed. We have a number of cars, Jim, that have elected to go to that outside line. And by the way, they consider the inside line to be the one behind the pace car, and we're going to watch for it here. I don't know if no, the pace car stayed out. So uh, it's going to be Niesner to the inside and Cope to the outside. And going with Cope on the outside, number 17, Mike Garvey. And we have heard Mike Garvey say a number of times, if the outside's empty, why not use it? This could be a lot of fun on this restart when we come back. Welcome back to USA International Speedway. This choose rule is already proving to be interesting. Cope, Garvey, Sawinski, Legacy, Miller, Sontag, all going to the outside where they say here it's not fast. Well, we're back to green. We're going to find out in a big hurry. Niesner leading him down in. Whoa! Cope actually brushed the outside wall, got a little loose, and immediately drops right in behind Niesner. And uh, before this caution came out, Cope was flying anyway, and now he makes a big move to the inside. Mike Cope started in the eighth position and used any group possible to take the fourth position away before the caution oh. came out. Niesner trying to mack on the inside. No dice. Mike Cope, your new race leader. Niesner gets very, very loose, and we've got a brouhaha in the back. Sontag involved, 63 pile involved as well. And a huge slew, the green machine right there, I believe, that is Kyle. And oh boy, look at this. We've got the number 57 involved in that as well, Gary Sherman. Number 24 is uh, Rich Locke. 
Boy, a huge, and you can see damage right there in the Sherman's car, pretty severe. It's aesthetic. I mean, it's, it didn't get into the frame, it doesn't look like, but with that spoiler gone, he's in trouble. Those speeds are certainly something to worry about. This is the 75 of Travis Foster. His crew chief and co-owner is Todd Bodine, the 15-year NASCAR driver veteran, is on the pit box. Travis trying to make his way into a full season of ASA racing after just one start a year ago. He's also involved. Well, here, let's take a look, first of all, at what happened to Neeser. He just got loose by himself. He was trying to come back down in. And you can see behind him, as everybody checks up, 71 Sontag lifts maybe a little Look bit of the car in the right-hand side. He's going around. Yep, certainly does. And oh. what happens there, Refter punches the front straightaway wall. This car went skyward as well. Boy, a lot of cars, including Robbie Pyle, started 19th. That's yep. the problem of qualifying near the rear of the field. He didn't have a chance to get through the field. That car that went uh, airborne, was Toby Ford, listen to this. Toby Porter's the guy that got airborne in the Meyer Chevrolet, so some uh, potential concerns there about how that car is going to be uh, able to run right now. Toby had a very high thought about coming into this race. He ran just a couple of ASA races two years ago. He finished third here, his first starting in ASA, so his first outing here in a second season, not the greatest. Well, lots of problems on the track. Let's get down to the pits, Ken. Standing here with Robbie Pyle. Robbie, tell me what went wrong from your point of view. I couldn't hear what you're saying. They're talking on the radio. It was just a mess out there. That uh, I don't know if that's a product of these restarts or not, but uh, when you're in the back there, there's a good chance you're going to get caught in stuff. Oh, obviously having some problems. He already feels like he got jousted here because of the restart procedures, guys. It's going to cause some controversy. Well, it's interesting. I don't know whether, you know, you could actually blame it too much on the restart. If things have settled just a little bit, obviously Niesner got loose on his own. And it looked like everybody just kind of that checkup and, uh, and and Sontag lifted a little bit abruptly and it caught some people by surprise. Well, let's check in, find out uh, the perspective from Rob Albright. I'm with Zach Neesner's crew chief, Ryan Perkingstad. Ryan, what did Zach say and what did you see? Uh, just good, good on the outside there. He just got a, got a little too high. I got some marbles on the right front and just couldn't turn. Well, obviously, he's taking responsibility for what happened there to Neesner, at least, his driver is, and that's always a good sign, guys. Well, it certainly is making things interesting. There's the number 44 of Casalino who was down in the pits. I don't know whether he was really caught up in that brouhaha, but he's struggling anyway this week and just not able to muster much speed out of that McDonald's machine. But uh, I'll tell you what, right now, the guy who was able to take advantage, nonetheless, of that new choose rule to great effect was Cope, Garvey, and Sawinski. Gee, a lot of veteran experience there. Certainly is. It certainly is. And those veterans are up front, and they're going to try to get there because all those rookies qualified up front. We see Robbie Pyle mired in the back, one of the veterans now behind the wall. So things are shaping up pretty strangely here in the opening race. Well, Ken Stout, a lot of tape on the back of uh, Gary Sherman's number 57. Yeah, these guys are in here working frantically. A lot of damage done to the right rear or right side of that car, I should say. I don't know if there's any mechanical damage done or not. They sent him right back out with just some of that 200-mile-per-hour tape. We'll see if it works for him. Well, this is one of the quicker tracks, particularly with straight line speed, as Sherman went out trying to stay as close to being on the lead lap as he could. Now comes back in for a little bit more work, but we're going to find out just how good that tape is, I would suspect, in fairly short order. So we've got 16 laps complete and an awful lot happening here at U.S. International Speedway. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back as we have just gone back to green here at USA International Speedway. Mike Cope leads. That is 17 Mike Garvey, the Janet King Chevy right there. But on the outside, the 96 rookie Wade Day, the medicine shop Chevrolet, trying to make that outside work. And the two veterans working him over pretty well right now. Day trapped outside. He finally drops in behind. Sawinski sits right there and forth. That number one Country Joe's home Chevrolet. Well, Sawinski did the right thing, biding his time and going down this back straightaway single file. He has a breathing room now as they've sorted out early here after this restart. And we have another caution that has come out. We'll update you on that in just a minute. But we'll try. We're not exactly sure what happened. We do see uh, one of the competitors making an early move to the pits. That's the 06. John Dial was off song off of turn number two on that restart. His car was without power. They're telling now they're, they're waving across the next saying, kill the motor. Perhaps there's some fluid down from his 06. ASI Limited Chevrolet. Well, that would make sense, certainly, obviously, because uh, I didn't see any incident out there at this stage. So uh, obviously problems early on for the Scotsman John Dial. There is a good look at Stephen Light, the 17 year old who this year has teamed up with one of the most savvy crew chiefs in the business. 
NSA crew chief's responsibility goes beyond just picking the right equipment. Perhaps more importantly is picking the right young driver. And in the case of crew chief Howie Ledow, he's done that seven times, picking seven rookies who have earned rookie of the year status. Howie, what is it with you and rookies? Well, first of all, I've been uh, very lucky. Uh, every one of the rookies I've had has just been a tremendously talented driver, and uh, seems like I've have a, a knack with uh, understanding and communicating well with them. And uh, Steven's no different. Maybe Steven is a little bit different. In fact, different in a couple of ways. He's just 17 years of age and is thus Howie's youngest, and he's already being carefully watched by NASCAR owners Richard Childress and Rick Hendrick. Well, he certainly has all the skills, and he is going to be a lot of fun to watch this year. Meanwhile, one of our veterans in some dire trouble in the early going. Rob Albright? Well, during the driver's meeting yesterday, one of the most outspoken, I don't know if I'd say critics, but a driver who expressed the most concern about this choose rule was Brian Reffner. Brian, the only thing is, you said you were concerned about the end of the race, not this early. Yeah, it's unfortunate. You know, uh, Menard's car didn't have a very good start we had engine trouble qualifying and uh and we found the, and fixed that and that put us in the back and where i didn't want to be and you know lo and behold the first double file restart yeah i couldn't see what happened something happened up front and the inside lane was backing up looked like somebody got turned around and you know and i, I got into binders and got turned from behind and you know it's just unfortunate because you know it's ash has a lot of competitive racing and uh you know, maybe it's just the first race. I don't know. I, I'm pretty disappointed right now. Brian, obviously, for good reason, very disappointed. Was it the choose rule? I don't really know. I think the bottom line is he's just frustrated, guys, to be out this early. Back up to you. Understandably so. Took a quick look during that replay. I think it was, uh, was Casalino who got into the back of him. We also want to remind you that coming up tomorrow, 3 p.m., FIM World Superbike Action, second event from Phillip Island, Australia. It is coming up 3 p.m. Eastern Time, 12 p.m. Pacific. The Superbikes, FIM Superbikes, Phillip Island, Australia. Don't miss that. It is going to be incredible. Well, here we go again, Jim. Everybody choosing options here. And uh, you look on the outside, uh, coming up right there is Kevin Sawinski, fourth at the time of the caution. He now moves up to essentially spot two outside of our race leader. Mike Hope grabbed the lead away from Zach Easter by starting on the outside of an earlier restart. Now let's see if Kevin Sawinski can do the same. Leading laps equals race points, bonus points. They just tied, And that's what Sawinski's after in a quest for a second consecutive championship. And Cope and Sawinski just touched. And I think maybe that was Cope just trying to let Sawinski know it wasn't going to be easy. But look at the run Sawinski got out of turn three, or out of two, dives down into three. Cope still on the inside. But Sawinski racing him awfully tough. Oh, Legacy going around big time with the 17 of Garvey. Both of them find the pit side barrier. Garvey backing it in, Legacy nosing it in. Boy, Legacy, well, he got away with one. I don't know if that the camber on that right front looked messed up, but it may just be the camber. But look at Garvey sitting in the car and shaking his head. Very, very frustrated right now. And it looked like he may have got into that right rear of that car pretty good. Trying to get the car back in gear. Scott Lagasse qualified third and finished fourth here last year. So certainly he didn't want to get in any sort of mess here. He knows the speeds and what can happen. There's Mike Garvey showing his appreciation as he's trying to get his car right in. But again, on the restart, the cars get back up to song off a of turn number four. And we had contact between two of the top five runners in this race. Well, we're going to go back and take a look at it, Jim, and let's see where it started. Here's the 17 of Garvey, a little bit to the outside. He goes to, for his own line. Looks like Legacy made it out of lifted off the corner to get Garvey gained that position. Then they went around. Now, the one, what I'm wondering, it looked like maybe the 96 Watch. away day. No, Gar, uh, Legacy was already turning. As Mike Garvey made his way up off of turn number four, Scott Legacy was behind him and to his outside. As Garvey cleared himself, he thought, here, take a look, take a listen to this. Well, a tough break for both of them. First, let's check it with Ken Stout down with Scott Legacy's pit. A lot of damage to the left front end, guys. They actually had to lift the car up to get the jack underneath it. One of the crew members looked underneath the front end. He said, it looks like it's okay to me. Put the left front back on it. Maybe he just had a flat tire. They might get lucky here. He's going to go back out and give it a try, guys. Uh, he does have a little bit of damage to that the hood on that side as well. Aerodynamic problems could come into play, uh, particularly, you know, concern having 
air get underneath that, lift that hood up. We'll keep track of that very carefully. And you may wonder why he didn't change that tire. We saw grass on the tires. They put it back on. They're checking the front end over. You can change fuel or change tires on any pit stop. You can't do both. So as they got in down pit road for Scott Legacy, they put fuel in. They couldn't change that tire if it was okay. Let's get down to Rob Albright with Mike Garvey's pit. Shane Tesh, not a great start to your season, obviously. What did Mike say happened? Ah. Uh. I, he didn't really say. Someone got into the back of him a little bit. You know, the Janet King Chevrolet was running real strong. Thought if we could get some green flag around here, we could run to the front. Said the car felt great. It's coming in. Thought we had a great night ahead of us. Uh, unfortunate for the Janet King team. He is trying some new stuff. Just didn't work out. Has he been able to give you any assessment and yet not yet back here? Do you think you can get the car back on the racetrack this evening? I don't know. He said it wouldn't move, so I'm sure we got the rear ends tore up, some trailing arms. And we'll bring it in. We'll fix it. Do the best we can. Get that Janet King Monte Carlo back out there and turn as many laps as we can. I mean, points race is just getting started. We got 15 more races to make up. Mike Garvey finished fifth in points last year. They'll get him out if they can, guys. All right, and there is Mrs. Garvey, and obviously an awful lot of concern. She's doing the spotting up top here. Now, we talked about that great buzz, the energy, with some of the developments this season. So we decided to talk to a number of the drivers this, uh, this race and find out what they were looking to most with the ASA season coming up. Here's what Mike Garvey said. I'm looking forward to going to the big tracks. Uh, like I said, I'm excited about going back to Milwaukee, Pikes Peak. Uh, I think that's where the future ASA is. I love those kind of tracks. I like our chance at those kind of tracks, and uh, that's what I'm really pumped up about. Welcome back to the SK Hand Tool 200 at USA International Speedway, Lakeland, Florida. 40 laps of 200 in the books. And there is Mike Garvey on the back of the hook, not looking too good. Here's our replays, and uh, Jim, Contact here with the black car of Mike Garvey spinning around to Scott Legacy again. They both got contact by that car going underneath the Maroon 96 of Wade Day. It was almost an accordion effect coming off of turn number four. Let's go in car now. Coming across the nose of Legacy, so it appeared Legacy just did have nowhere to go as Garvey thought he was clear. Well, let's get down to Ken Stout in Scott Legacy's pit. Uh, very upset, Scott Legacy. Tell me what went wrong, Scott. I, I don't know, to be honest with you, I couldn't tell what happened up in front of us. Uh, Mike got sideways, I tried to check up to keep from turning him, and I uh, got turned from behind, so I don't know. Had a great car, I gotta thank everyone helping me do this deal. My guys have been working real hard, and we had the car, I think, beat tonight. You never know, you can't say that, but anyway, we'll see if we get her back out there. Back up to you guys. Boy, he is very, very disappointed, understandably so. As Rob said, a lot of people think he's got the speed to be able to bring home Rookie of the Year. Tough way to start it. We are back to green as we complete lap 42. And look at that. Uh-oh. That Mike was Mike Cope. Cope, and he's just gone almost dead step middle of the track. Reed Sorensen waited for him as he started on the outside of the front row. On the restart, Mike Cope never up to saw him. Sorensen matted it, and Sawinski went to the inside of that restart. Crazy things are happening tonight in this first choose rule opportunity, but certainly Sawinski and Reed Sorensen, first and fourth, the points a year ago, taking advantage here. And let's point out, Reed Sorensen, folks, started 21st. And the reason is we, as he was so far back was he was in the back of car that had never been used. I mean, it took to the track absolutely raw for qualifying. Obviously, they figured something out. He has put together a stunning run. Some other great action in the back. Joey Miller there, the great clip Chevy, trying to take a run and get by the number 30, Travis Kittleson, in the uh, Chevrolet as well. Some great action here. Ron Gore, Joey Miller taking a look backward. He's well back in the order. Michael has gone down payroll, but as we keep the action here, we see that the uh, number four, Stephen Light's trying to get in position as well on the inside. Let's go down to Rob Albright, down with Mike Cope's pit. Well, I don't have a lot of information. I think that's because his entire crew is perplexed. They're not sure what the problem is for Mike Cope. You can see the wrench going in, an adjustment made. Right side tires may be all that he had a problem with. He is back out on the racetrack, but guys, that's what they expect. It was a right, tire, right front tire that went down, guys. Wow. Well, with all the accident we've had, obviously, and a lot of it on the front straight, maybe there was a little piece of debris that just wasn't caught. What do you say? Out. The leader is the first one through that stuff as yeah, well. Absolutely. Caution. And especially if you're dropping the hammer and uh, you're a little bit loaded up sideways uh, trying to get on it, that's a good opportunity to cut a tire down. As good as these traction TAs are, debris still can get through them just a little bit. Watching the battle here, 42 Niesner and the 30 of Kittleson, and they're back in the order just a little bit here. There is the number 71, the yellow car of Sontag, 
who was coming up here. Let's get back down to uh, find out a little bit more about Mike Copeland. Well, a clarification and a correction, guys. It was not, in fact, a right side tire. It was a gear problem. The car gets hung up in a couple of different gears, particularly on the restart. So that's going to probably plague Mike for the rest of the night. That is bad news indeed because now he's mired back in the pack and if that restart is going to be killing him all evening long, Mike Cope's uh, hopes may have just uh, absolutely gone away. Tough, tough break for a guy who's looking awfully impressive. And Cope did have the restart again. He went from eighth up to the lead. And here's Peter Cozzolino coming down pit row. We mentioned a two-time winner with a provisional fire now erupts as he hit the turn two wall hard and lifts down to pit row that A&A manufacturing Chevy. No caution, and uh, he obviously controlled and brought it around. Now he's got a little bit of a flash fire underneath that right front corner. We're going to go back and watch this battle right here. That is Sontag, the Yellow Terry's Automotive Group. That is one of the uh, Fords in the field, and he's got some serious pressure right there from number five, the Collis Equipment. That is also a Ford of Rick Beebe, so those two going after it with Toby Porter's Meyer Chevy right in the mix. Rick Beebe hand-built this Ford as we see him lead that pair of uh, right behind him. Beebe's very proud of this race car. He hopes he can race more events this year. They're looking at a limited schedule for the ASA veterans, so Beebe trying to make a good run here and attract some sponsorship. Well, he just blasted by those two and ends up now in the sixth spot. Down to Ken Stout. And Peter Consolino really heating things up, you might say. This one's on fire, guys. He even got a little bit of help from Butch Miller's team over here for the fire extinguishers, but they'll get this thing put out. Look like it was just a header fire, but obviously a lot of fluids out of this car, so a lot of damage to the right front as well. That's going to end his chances for winning this one in 2004, guys. Well, he was caught up in that early melee with so many vehicles involved in the front straight. Maybe something just let go going into that turn. And a tough, tough break there. Meanwhile, we were watching the number one of Kevin Sawinski, the Country Joe Holmes Chevrolet, starting to open up the margin about a half second over the target Havilene Dodge of Reed Sorensen. Nice story there. And right behind them, guess who? Butch Miller, the uh, Timberwolf machine. The double file restart, the choose rule ASA has implemented, has helped all three of these now veteran drivers. Kevin Sawinski was able to get to the outside of Mike Holmes and gain the chance to get the lead away on a restart. Reed Sorensen started way back in the field, jumped to a backup car. They made more changes. He dropped to the tail of the field at the start. There's no way I've seen this before in ASA. This early in the race, 53 laps in, a guy from last to second without making a pit stop or anybody else on leave that making a pit stop. That says a lot about the competition here, but also the smarts of Gene Roberts now, the crew chief of Reed Sorensen's efforts. And that juice rule, I mean, the strat we, you know, we talked last year, Jim, so much about how the crew chiefs now and the drivers have to be such strategists with the new pit rules. Well, now with the choose rule and the restarts, that comes even more into play at this stage. I love it. You call an 18-year-old. We have a yellow. We have another yellow that has come out. You calling an 18-year-old a veteran, but that indeed the fact. And Trevor Stewart, another rookie, Ironically, this guy was the crew chief on this very same car last year. Got tabbed to uh, get behind the wheel this year. And, uh, well, the learning curve, pretty steep. Well, indeed, he has a very extensive late model background and modified background on dirt. Just a couple late model starts in I-94 member track in Minnesota. So Trevor Stewart learning the hard way here as he, uh, again, making the show in ASA is tough enough. Trevor, his first start on a big track like this, certainly wanted to have a better showing, but uh, up in turn number one, things close up in a hurry. It gets narrow heading into that first turn. He may have made contact and got around. Now it looks like the car able to roll fairly freely. Unfortunately, Peter Cozzolino stepping out of his car as we take a look at the top 10 going to break. Just a little while ago in a happier moment, we also asked Peter Cozzolino, what's he looking for this season? I'm really looking forward to going to the speedways because I uh, haven't been on any of the, you know, bigger than a mile and a half. And, uh, I mean, going that fast and, and racing that hard where all the big boys race is, is kind of where I want to be. We are back at Lakeland, Florida, USA International Speedway under caution. And this time we had a slew of people, including our race leader, coming into the pits. Let's take a look now at the 2004 pit rules, Jim. Indeed, you can do tires or fuel on any pit stop. It's a two-tire rule. Some teams took on fuel this pit stop. Two, some teams took on tires. In a 200-lap race in ASA, two, hunt, two pit stops mandatory, a minimum number of pit stops during the event. And uh, just as we saw, a lot of lead lap cars came down. Now it's time for the lap cars to get their chance down pit road. And, Sawinski certainly was fast in, fast out. Well, let's take a look at some of those stops. Uh, we recorded them while we were away. Here is Sawinski's. 
And he came in and it went fuel. Wanted to get that done early. We're now past quarter distance, so we're well in the window there. Quick stop, fuel only, and he was away. This is Sorensen, same story, fuel only. And this is the first time these crews have had a chance to work on pit road under race conditions. They've had pit stop practice all winter long and a close call there for youngster Sorensen. Very close call indeed. Let's go down to Ken Stout for a little bit of a follow-up. You know, guys, I heard that the fuel window was going to be between 75 and 80 laps. I just spoke with crew chief for Mike Sawinski, of course, Mike Chappie. He says we are good to go for the rest of the race here at 60 laps. So the only thing they'll come back in for would be right side tires much later on if needed, guys. Well, we've had quite a few cautions, Jim, and obviously that stretches out that fuel mileage and uh, it maybe is going to be the reason that some of these guys are going to be able to do that. We're now ready to choose has uh, come into place, I believe, and uh, it is Miller to the inside. This is going to be interesting, but Rick Beebe, who has been incredibly fast, has gone to the outside, and he's been just a missile early on. We're coming back to green as we complete lap 61. Boy, but Miller read that beautifully and leads comfortably down into turn one. Butch Miller won this race one year ago on tire management strategy. He does not want to pit this early in the race. Sawitsky finished second to him last year by changing right side tires twice. Butch Miller may have the key in this element, left side tires and when to change them. According to his crew chief, Dion Deneau, if the car is good, we're not going to change it early on. We may just move fuel first. If we need to make an adjustment, we will. They're very happy with this race car right now. Uh, never are with either Bush or Dion no, <laughs> and what they have decided they are going to do. It is absolutely remarkable what these guys are able to achieve. A little bit deeper in the pack here, watching some of the great racing. There's Mike Cope. Let's check in once again with Rob Albright on some of the activity with the number 29 of Sorensen. Two spectacular things here, amazing things about Reed Sorensen. He comes back out after that stop in ninth position. That's amazing. What's even more so, this car had only two laps prior to the start of this race. Those were his qualifying laps. They made no adjustments whatsoever. Now the front row, Zach Neesner made a tire pressure adjustment along with fuel. And Stephen Light, he made a track bar adjustment. He was telling his crew chief the car was too tight, guys. Well, it's interesting, too. Keep in mind, qualifying occurred in the hottest part of the afternoon, really, just around noon. And uh, there was some cloud cover that, uh, that came in. But the cars were then impounded. You can't do any work on them. They must have hit the combination pretty good for what it was going to be like tonight. Whether they intended to or not, with that little bit of time, it's sure working. They qualified at 11.30 this morning. Couldn't touch the cars after qualifying. They had to start the race on the tires they qualified on. The teams had very little to do besides air pressure before the start of the race. What that means is, after that morning practice session this morning, you had to set your car for the race, and hopefully qualifying would pay off, because they're all worried about the track tightening up tonight and trying to get the handle and predicting what's going to happen 10 hours after they get out of the race. Yeah, back to unbelievable. And there's Sorensen trying to work his way by Ed Brown and work with some traffic. He has got Sawinski, the country Joe Chevrolet, right behind him. We had a look just a minute ago, and Mike Cope just reminded me he's two laps down, and I think a guy is going to be going to the outside a lot with that shoes rule if somebody was that fast but struggling right now. Sorensen can't get by Brown, and Sawinski hounding him right now big time. Well, these guys ahead of that big target dodge and Reed Sorensen, they've all did not make pit stops. So ultimately, Reed Sorensen was the first one off the pit road. He's now into the seventh position. Just ahead is that Aqua number 60, the Grub Auto Repair Chevy of Ed Brown, a Florida native. And that is for a position, by the way. And in front of them, another very talented young rookie is Tim Russell in the uh, Aramark uniforms. Renai car, but we have another caution here on the speedway. The 21 and of Jimmy Bull. Henderson and the eight of Chris Stump. Chris Stump, the McDonald's Chevy, making his debut for Chris Stump Racing. Glenn Allen Jr., the longtime veteran in ASA, overseeing that effort as a team manager. Stump goes around, and Jimmy Henderson is second loop in his ASA debut. Ooh, and we've got some damage right there. That is Travis the 75. Foster. Travis Foster, more problems for Travis. Just been a tough go for him ever since we went green. Looking as they stack up on the restart, we see a tap here by Sontag that really sent Chris Stump around. Sontag came in for tires. It was a lot faster. Foster does the sky job and keeps it going, but... Again, Brett Sontag, a car that took on right side tires faster on that restart. It cost Chris Stump as he was a lot slower off the corner, according to Sontag's exit speed. Kyle Jones was the guy that Foster got into and went airborne, so probable uh, situation in terms of problems for Kyle Jones as well. And uh, by the way, I did talk to, uh, to Glenn Allen Jr. a little bit earlier today. He said he's going to run the two Kentucky races. That was a little bit of sponsorship, and they're building a, a Speedway car. But he said, that's it, because I'm really going to try and get Chris Stump going this season. He said he's got so much potential, and it's been tough. 
but uh, obviously problems early here as we're watching some of the activity. We want to remind you as well that there's an awful lot to do tomorrow starting at 7 p.m. in terms of catching up on what happened over the course of the weekend. We have Speed News NASCAR edition, which will be giving us a look at what happened at Bristol. We have Speed News Sunday tomorrow at 7.30 p.m. for all the other news in terms of motorsports that unfolded over the weekend. And of course, starting at 8 p.m., it'll be NASCAR Victory Lane presented by Travel Lodge to sort of flesh out all of the activities that happened uh, at the big race at Bristol. So don't miss any of that. But uh oh, here we go. And Miller finally looking like he's going to come in. 70 laps into this again that green flag waving means the pits are open that's an ASA official on the backstretch signifying to the teams come on down if you feel like it lead lap cars only this time by second place Rick Beebe is going to join him coming in so this is going to be an interesting development and uh, boy, I tell you Miller and Danu so good at playing the strategy game and we'll see what's going to happen here let's check in with Ken Stout who's going to be watching it up close. Butch Miller comes flying in as the guys go to work. They'll take on fuel and they'll crank up three rounds of track bar. Oh, and he just stole it. Butch Miller just stole it. A little problem with the fuel as well. Fires it back up. That'll cost him some time, guys. Three rounds of track bar. That's a fairly severe adjustment. And obviously, Butch trying to keep the tires alive. He is so good at that, as you pointed out. Very good on tire management. Again, he changed right side tires twice, left side tires one year ago to win this race. They thought, at least in Kevin Swinsky's pit, talking to crew chief Mike Chaffee, that was the difference in the race. Which one? Kevin Swinsky, his driver, finished second. Now, I get a feeling one of the savviest moves we've seen in this race thus far. We just watched the number one of Sawinski, who did fuel last costume, just came in and did tires. His two stops are done. Welcome back to USA International Speedway. The SK Hand Tool 200, 74 laps are complete. And down to the inside right now is the 96 away day. But look who's outside. Mike Pope, he is so fast, he's trying to take advantage of the choose rule. Mike Pope is one lap down, but again, if you're behind the race leader on a restart, you still get in the choose mix. Absolutely, and here we go. Day rolls into the throttle. Mike Pope on the outside, and boy, a little bump again. Cope really trying to squeeze Day just a little bit. It may have paid off. Cope getting a pretty good run out of two. Day stays there. Little wiggle by Day. Got loose. Day dives down into three. Cope still right there in his right fender. Cope floats out just a little bit wide. That's Ed Brown and Sorensen right underneath as well. Let's check in with Rob Albright on. Well, Rob, four contact between Day and Cope. Way Day is not going to give any quarter. He's a talented driver. He has spent some time in Bush cars as well as in some ARCA machines. Two top 10 ARCA finishes last season. But he is really rolling in this machine that last year on a couple of occasions was driven by Gary St. Amon, who's watching us tonight, guys. I was going to say the colors are very different, but that is the Appalachian Motorsports car. And he's doing a fine job. And you know, everybody's been saying that the outside line here at Lakeland is not the fast way to go. Well, there's a lot of guys out there who seem to think it's certainly are showing different. Mannheim Auto, Florida Auto Auction, Chevy of Mike Hope, that black car with the blazing orange numerals, back on the lead lap at the very tail end. So he's leading now the race leader Wade Day, heading into turn one. Again, Cope back on the lead lap. No problems on that restart for Cope, the veteran driver who had the lead early and had a problem shifting through the gears on a restart. Yeah, clean as could be. Sorensen, well, he nosed ahead of Brown for just a minute, picked up second spot, but Brown coming right back after him. Those two still side by side. Right here, Sorensen comes off the corner, and he's clear, and I'm sure a spotter just told him that. You can see Brown tuck in behind, and what a, a great opportunity for Brown and that Grubbs Auto Body, number 60, up for him. Oh, and as I say that, he gets loose, Toby and... Porter. Toby Porter's in the Toby deal. Toby Porter well. going in with him. Hard in the deal. Wow, tough break for Toby. Everything moved from... Uh, the shops in Wisconsin for Toby Porter down to his shop in the shadows of Greenville Pickens Speedway in South Carolina. This is not what Toby Porter wanted to start the season with. Boy, and I am, uh, I'm going to stop telling drivers that I think they're doing a nice job with a great opportunity here because every time I seem to mention it, something happens. Now, Porter talking to Brown, and obviously Porter thinks that the problem was Ed Brown's and not his own, and I'm not, I obviously couldn't tell. We'll have to take a look at the replays, whether Porter got into the back of Brown and caused it, or whether Porter got into the back of Brown as a result of Brown getting loose by himself. I'm guessing it was the latter, but Jim, we're going to take a look at some replays. We'll find out. Neither driver's taking uh, fresh tires yet. He was it. sideways all the way, and as he got sideways, Porter saw an opportunity down low, and the door closed. It slammed on the front nose of that Meyer Chevy. 
reporter obviously wanted to have a word with him right here it is but Brown was already sideways Brown was loose off a of turn four again Toby Porter came in and fueled up he didn't change tires yet so they had the same equal tires it just looked like Porter had the run off the corner Brown got sideways as we mentioned by himself and Toby's maybe talking about please uh, don't do that again I got a wrecked race car I got to fix now well my guess is Brown's response was well yeah I didn't really want to hardly intentional but obviously, Toby Porter a little bit tightened and upset right now. Let's go down to Rob Albright. You know, in just an instant, Joey Bishop, your first race is crew chief for Toby Porter. From elation to despair, what happened out there? Uh, a lot of traffic's been kind of rough all night. And, uh, man, I'm just trying to pass for fourth, you know, and the guy just lost it right in front of us, and we wrecked. But we'll get it fixed, and we'll get it back next week, and we'll be good. Joey Bishop, obviously very distraught, as is his driver, to Ken. Butch Miller coming in. We know he's already taken on fuel. We saw the adjustment made. Now he's going to take on left side tires, which would indicate that he'll probably stop one more time tonight. I'd have to think he'd take on right side before the night's completely over with. So these guys are working on this car, trying to repeat another win here in Lakeland, guys. Well, Jim, as I recall, that was a strategy he used to great effect right here last year was instead of going to rights, went to lefts and uh, got that car to just hook up incredibly. He came in right behind Sorensen and Sorensen's crew once again doing a stunning job getting him out in front of Miller uh, as well. So I'll tell you what, that, uh, that, that crew for Reed Sorensen doing a stunning job. There's a look at number 96, Wade Day. Here's our Odor Eaters race summary to this point. 82 laps complete, five different leaders, four lead changers, 22 cars still on the lead lap, but seven cautions, a total of 40 laps. It has been a little bit tough at this stage right now, uh, up to this point in the race with an awful lot of cautions. Now, right now, this guy, number 35, Doug Stevens, has been a surprise in a sense since he got here, been very, very fast, back in 21st right now, but working his way back to the front. We also talked to him about what he's looking forward to this year. One year ago, Doug Stevens had some pretty good luck here at Lakeland. He led about 30 laps here at our inaugural event for the 2003 season. He hopes to carry that one step farther. If I'm not mistaken, Doug, you're actually doing pretty good with just a few laps left to go in the race. Yes, sir. We had a good car last year and uh, just had some bad luck there at the end. We led 30-something uh, laps and had a really good car. We're back again this year, and uh, we got a really great car this year and uh, looking for good things to happen. He found out that the number was going to be pulled from him. Last year, he's number 98. He says, I've got no problem with that. It was a terrible luck number for me. He's real happy with 35. So if luck goes well and the money doesn't run out, he's signed up for Rookie of the Year status. We'll find out how he does in 04. And he showed up here and uh, was incredibly quick right from the get-go. As I said, struggling just a little bit right now, but still on the lead lap and has a real shot at things here before the night is out. We'll be right back to Lakeland, Florida. Welcome back, everybody. 86 laps complete now here at the USA International Speedway. There's the number 60 of Ed Brown on the back of the rollback, so we're getting near cleaning up the incident here. We want to remind you that coming up inside Nextel Cup Monday, 7 p.m. Eastern Time, Alan Bestwick and the gang are going to be dissecting what happened at Bristol in their very unique, fun, and informative way. It's coming up Monday, 7 p.m. Eastern Time, inside Nextel Cup. And how about inside Nextel Cup? Well, there's a lot of ASA alumni that are involved in that series and, and doing rather well, as well as in the Bush series. Uh, how about Jimmy Johnson, winner of Darlington last week, 98 Rookie of the Year right here. The runner-up in the 97 opener is Matt Kenseth, who's Burns leader right now there as well. Mark Martin, Rusty Wallace. I mean, obviously, some tremendous talent, and that is what ASA does better than anybody. It's called building champions. Let's go down to Rob Albright right now with another potential future champion. As a badly battered number 11 rolls in right in front of us, Toby Porter, you can't be very happy. It looked like you had a great race car. Yeah, we did. I mean, we had a good race car all weekend. Um, we was fast yesterday in practice, it was just bad draw uh, this morning. Had to go out first to qualify, but got us back there in the back, but we worked our way up. We had a good car, and I was just riding. Just, man, we ain't even halfway yet. And, um, I'm not real sure about these restarts, what they're going to do about it, but it's tore up a lot of race cars tonight. <laughs> but I don't know. Um, I just hate it for Myers, Tony, Stouffer's, Edie's, Tyson's, Myers. I mean, uh, uh, they. Toby, you look pretty animated on the back stretch. What words did you have for Ed Brown? Well, I mean, it's just that we've not, we're not, we wasn't even halfway, and um, he was racing side by side there with Reed. Um, all they had to do is just back off a little bit. I was going to let him in. Um, 
not even halfway. I mean, there's no sense in racing that hard. And he just lost it up off the corner and took me with him. I mean, it's just uh, too early in the race for that kind of stuff. Too early in the race and early in the season out for Toby Porter. Ken? You know, guys, I wanted to show you the tires that just came off of Butch Miller's car. You know, we've been talking about these Traction TA for years, these radial tires and how good they are. They just measured these tires here virtually nowhere at all. Now, granted, this is the left side tires, and so they're not going to wear anywhere near as much as the right side. But the number one, the number two, the two, and the one, that's actually a code that the guys use here. They have a small gauge, and it's just plus one, plus two. He starts off with four, and then plus one, plus two. Right in there is about that much wear on these tires and it's also worn very very evenly of course it's a left rear excellent job let's go to the guys all right we are back to green and leader way day brings him along 30 kittleson he went to the outside now he tucks underneath trying to make the move number 15 miller so quick way up high goes day and he just did that on his own drove in too deep made the little mistake kittleson shoots through underneath miller going with him and day still trying to find out how we can get back into the line he is getting freight trained right now and a great job in the restart of the boss steel chevy by number 30 kittleson rob albright boy did he play that to perfection he certainly did and you know it's funny it was almost prophetic because his crew chief gary crook said we're really having a hard time getting around that 96 well he made it look awfully easy you know travis has not been very uh, spectacular so far this weekend he's been kind of quiet i asked gary if he's got a good race car he said we've got a great race car rob but we still need tires so a uh, long way to go yet for travis kittleson to win this race well, one of the things rob that i know for travis last year was the fact that he had some good runs but never got a win he wanted it so bad to show that he truly belonged and uh, obviously he's uh, in a good position up front right now but as you said still needs some tires on that car joey miller the great clip chevy right behind him and a good run there by the number 19 of casey smith the smith racing left-hander chassis dodge doing a very very solid effort right now and uh, in fact they're drawing away just a little bit for the rest of the pack and casey and his dad glenn said you know we need to change our look let's change the number change the color last year they had limited starts in the asa uh, national tour they just said let's go something completely different casey's pretty energized about this season and they switched the dodge body which is also new to the asa national tour this year and that yeah, color's pretty sharp we hope there's a name on that side sometime soon as they're uh, funding it out of their own pocket right now well, obviously, they deserve a shot at it. We're on the board with Joey Miller looking back, and you can see he's a snowmobile fan, too. A little Articat. Well, he comes from Minnesota, and obviously, that's uh, home of uh, Articat. So. I asked his team members in Country Joe Racing, I asked, uh, hey, you guys still have snow up there in the Twin Cities? He said, well, there was a little bit of snow on Tuesday when we left, but I think it was 60 degrees or so. So there was snow into this week in Minnesota. So certainly, they got their sleds out a lot this uh, off season. Joey Miller just starting to hound the number 30 of Travis Kittleson and Rob Albright. This young man, we heard about it early, he is trying to finish races as spectacular as he, as he starts them. Joey Miller is having a great night. Bon Suss just told his young driver, be patient and be cautious. You know, he spun qualifying today, and a lot of people said, yeah, that's just what we've come to expect from Joey Miller, but he's really settled in. Bon has got him calmed way down. Bon Suss, of course, has been around for a lot of years with a lot of different drivers, and he says he's good to go now. He's made both of his stops. He said, we'll follow what the other guys do among the leaders, but he said, we don't actually have to stop again, guys. Boy, that uh, strategy playing out very strong. And, of course, uh, it is his teammate, Kevin Sawinski, the defending champion, is somebody that Joey can lean on an awful lot. And that strategy fairly similar because Sawinski done with both his mandatory stops. Now it's just up to really what's going on with the car. Do they need more tires or not? I talked to his crew chief, Mike Chaffee, before the event. We already laid out what they did last year, two right side tire changes. They don't think they want to do anything besides what they absolutely have to, the bare minimum for Sawinski. Before the minimum pit stop rule was in place, he won a race by not pitting. He had excellent tire wear. They figured out the fuel mileage. They indeed are the monkey that everybody watches in the monkey see, monkey do end of things because that team has it together. Even if it's a guess, if it's the right call. They won the championship last year doing some very great pit strategies. Well, and he talked about consistency. He's got that same crew back. They're very proven from last year. That gives you so much confidence coming in. By the way, Miller just ran a lap over two-tenths of a second faster than number 30 Kittleson. 
as we come up and complete the halfway point. The BF Goodrich halfway leader award goes to Travis Kittleson and the number 30 Bob Steele Chevrolet. Nice job by Kittleson, but Joey Miller looks perhaps in that great clip Chevy to be the fastest car on the track right now. And the top three have opened up almost a second and a half lead over Stephen Light from the Sitco Chevy in four spot. We'll be right back. We're halfway here in Lakeland. Welcome back, everybody. We have a new leader, and we also have a caution. A couple of cars at least involved. The number 57, once again, involved in this one. Gary Sherman and the car up against the wall. Looks like it's the 0-1 of Jason Rudd. That is the uh, utterly smooth, utter cream Pontiac from Jason Rudd Motorsports, nephew of Nextel Cup star Ricky Rudd. And he was involved with the number 57 of Sherman, and he, he's driving that Dodge. I don't know whether he got into the wall at all or if so if he did very hard meanwhile there is number 15 and again joey miller the great clip chevy just driving a brilliant race snuck underneath the number 30 of travis kittleson and picked up the point and he did it decisively jim off of turn number two down this back straightaway you see kittleson just crossing the wheel that's enough to get joey right through there on the great clip chevy very clean pass for the run and again travis kittleson lost ground almost immediately so tires certainly a concern for kittleson and the bob steel chevy pit Oh, and there is some serious front end problem. He, yeah, that car is not steering at all for uh, Jason Rudd right now. Let's go back and take another look at what happened in the incident. Here's Gary Sherman going through the corner, gets a tap on the 21 of Jimmy Henderson, but ahead, we'll see if indeed it's ahead or behind as we're looking at this with you on the Speed Channel replay. Going to the inside is Tim Sauter, and we see back there, just to the outside of our screen, was Jason Rudd going around, certainly reacting to the incident already ahead of him. And it cost Rudd dearly as obviously he's got a broken front end on that car and it's fairly severe. That flashing, by the way, is not a fire. It's a reflection of the safety vehicle lights right there as it moves around. So Rudd uh, pretty much out of things right here. But uh, getting back to what we saw with Kittleson, I think his tires are gone. He just lit them up coming out of two. As you said, that's all that this guy, number 15, needed and just motored by. Arguably right now, the fastest guy in the track is number one, Sawinski, who uh, went by and picked up that uh, third spot, got around Smith very quickly as well, and closed on Kittleson like a missile. You know Kittleson's coming in, but look at Sawinski. We Looks said, like he's doing it too. We said he already made two stops. Sawinski came in for fuel and right side tires. Joey Miller stays out to keep the lead. But I don't know, Sawinski might have something here. He might jump on the left. He, he took very astute notes from a year ago and Butch Miller beat him with a left side change late in the race. Well, let's watch for it here, and Ken is there. Kevin Sawinski, of course, the left side going up. They are taking on left side tires, as Trado was just talking about. Looking for a quick change here and get right back out on the track. Let's go to Rob. Oh, a quick stall there, by the way, for Sawinski. For Stephen Light, it's right side tires, also a track bar adjustment. They go down, the car's still a little bit tight, according to Stephen. He came in running fifth, a little bit slow on the right front. He's trying to get away, pulls out right behind Wade Day, guys. Boy, and it looked as though there was a problem on the right side of the car for Sawinski. A crew member going after it uh, was in the uh, the uh, right side window area, so I don't know exactly what that may have been a problem with, but he got out nonetheless. Here's a good look at Tim Russell, currently running 15th, well on the lead lap with a great opportunity. And a little bit earlier, we checked in with him with Rob Albright and a brand new sponsor. The thermometer says 60 degrees, but it's actually in the mid 80s here in Central Florida today. But it's much hotter than that in the cockpit for one young rookie driver. Tim Russell is a rookie, and he has a one-time race sponsor. Home track, home state, one-time sponsor. Tim, are you feeling a lot of pressure as a rookie? Oh, yeah, the pressure's there, no doubt. But uh, been around this track a time or two, so uh, I think we got a pretty good handle on it. We qualified in, like, 15th or 16th, so we try to get a good top 15 running for the folks and uh, get a good showing. Well, who is that one-time sponsor? A company called Renai. What, you ask, is that? It is a brand-new product, a tankless water heater. Well, that's pretty interesting development and something, obviously, a, a space saver. So a uh, good opportunity for him. And it's great to see a local track guy come in with a good sponsor to be able to really put together a good program here. Superstock Rookie of the Year in 01. Kid's got a lot of potential. Speaking of which, looking right here at the number 66, Ryan Unzecker out of El Paso, Illinois. Has a little bit of arc experience. 
they were back row when this thing started and Jim he's made it up to seventh already he's got to be pretty fond of the choose rule his encyclopedia is filling up very quickly <laughs> the learning curve of ASA I think he's already on the volumes RST all the way down the road just an, an absolutely incredible job by Ryan Unzicker as he comes in here and uh, he's up front playing with the big boys right now and uh, how about number 33 Greg Stewart the body balance life force Chevrolet up into the fourth spot he goes to the outside we go back to green completing lap 112 Miller leads it Chad Wood the number two of the Wood Brothers Chevrolet on the outside and Stewart knifes underneath picks up third Chad Wood's been in the mix all evening long, kind of hunting around fifth, seventh, eighth, ninth was on the Kevin Swinsky pit strategy. He likes to stay out here in that bright blue number two, the sign one one Chevy. He now runs behind our race leader off the corner there. Chad Wood has yet to really dominate here. He's had a top five finish in ASA, and it was really the highlight finishing fourth last year. He certainly wants to get back on the map of contenders here as he's now got a couple years under his belt here out of Wisconsin. Nice to see Greg Stewart doing well, too, if you keep in mind what he went through last year. He had a couple of very fast races, but all in all, it was a pretty tough season. He kept getting caught up in incidents and the like, and boy, he'd sure love to break that streak. Not necessarily, obviously, he'd love to win, but just a good finish here to kick things off would really set him off in the right way. He's got his 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 old body balance sponsor along with Keener Lumber on board as well. And uh, really, he's got himself a good program this season. He's back in Fort Oaks, North Carolina, home base for him. He's also the only guy that I can remember has won the Hard Luck Award two years in a row by his ASA uh, compatriots. So again, last couple of years, he certainly wants to erase them and start fresh. Not a an award you want to win <laughs> once, let no alone way. repeat. That is just absolutely unpleasant to do that and he wants to break that streak but he's got to get by Chad Wood and Chad Wood having a strong run and Rob Albright uh, this guy he puts everything he can into this effort. Yeah, I talked to Chad just before the race started tonight and I said you know it's time for a new first time winner could it be you he just grinned at me and he said we've got a really strong race car we're much better than we qualified I think we could do it tonight and you know he's not a guy to brag I think Jim Trader will tell you that. So I think he really knew he had something special this evening, guys. And Chad is a hands-on guy. He's in that shop every day, not only preparing his car, but Travis Dasso is racing out of that same Wood Brothers racing shop. We mentioned the pole winner. Zach Neeser put the car on the pole. That's a Wood Brothers racing entry as well. So this team really has it together early, much to the credit of Chad with the mechanic. Now the driver showing his talents behind the wheel. Yeah, you're thinking, is that stretch too thin? And apparently not at all. There is the number 72, by the way, uh, who has worked his way up into the sixth spot. So certainly Wood Brothers. Uh, pretty well set right now. He's coming up on the 29 of Sorensen, and look, he's trying to get underneath that's out the number one of Sawinski, trying to work his way back up. Reed Sorensen, that white number 29 target car, was rookie of the year last year at age 17. St. Patty's Day this year, Travis Dassault turned 17. He's looking for rookie of the year. He wants to be the youngest rookie of the year ever as Sorensen playing that crowd last year. 17 years old, these guys able to do this. And when you think about what Sorensen did last year, winning that so quick but also a much much more mature mind uh, was was so special to watch Sorensen work right now behind him there is Kevin Sawinski of course two championships going for a third and a repeat and as the defending champion very curious to what uh, to hear what he's looking forward to as this season unfolds. I'd say the most challenging thing uh, is going to be probably the new restart rule. Uh, you know, it's going to be really tempting at tracks that you might be running mid-pack to move up to, to the lead group, but you got to have patience and, and know the track and know your car. So that's going to be the most challenging for me. Welcome back, everybody. 126 laps complete. We are under caution once again, and it's because of a fairly serious hit. Number 72, Travis Dassau, and the number 74 of Jay Middleton. Middleton Jim. right here, going in the corner. Dassau's behind this bunch. Robbie Pyle, 22 laps down, gets in the back of Middleton as he spins. Dassau gets tapped here by the 96 of Wade Day. Hard impact by the 72 of Dassau. Again, we just talked about the 17-year-old just turning 17, impressing, running in the top 10. But again, bunching up at a turn one, it narrows down. Robbie Pyle right there, Jay Middleton across the nose. He went spinning. Dassau really a secondary incident there with Wade Day contact. A little bit of a surprise in your mind for somebody of, uh, of Robbie Pyle's uh, stature that far down to get involved in an incident? Well, Robbie Pyle's been in his share, unfortunately, but being that many laps down, wanted to hold his line, perhaps at a fast race car, fast enough to stay on that lap. Let's go down to Ken Stout with Sawinski stop. Kevin Sawinski with a nice job pulling in here, aims the car outside, they'll change right side tires. Last time when he came in for the left sides, he stole that thing. Hopefully he'll get out a little bit better. Rob? Oh! 
Sorry, Rob, I didn't mean to jump on you, but Sawinski left with the jack still in the jack point in the back of his car. And that has got to be a penalty of some sort. Oh, boy. Such an incredible strategy. And look at that. There it is. Sawinski back on track, but he's got himself a big problem because the, uh, the actual hand jack that goes down through that rear window to the jack point sitting right there, Jim. That handle goes in a certain a little hole in the in the rear window, and it's a very small hole. You have to get it right onto a socket. He's bringing it back in. They have to do that. Let's take a look, see if we can on a real time replay at the end of that. Uh, maybe we'll wait on that as we bring him in. Here he comes. And I'll tell you what, his strategy was so strong and just a little mistake like that, huge. Well, might as well make the adjustment again. So he exits. Uh, obviously, he's got some problems. We're going to go back and show you the actual stop itself. And, uh, boy, I don't know whether he just released too soon on his own, whether he was waved out. But there you see a very frustrated crew. There's Mike Reesop. That's Kurt Danko, the rear tire changer and car chief, as he goes down to change the rears. Again, that tire carrier puts the wrench in. Now the team is orchestrating. Who does the change? Was it the Jackman, Mike Reesop? Was it the rear tire carrier that had the... No, Reesop was on his deal. The rear tire carrier was worried about getting that tire across. A new rule in ASA this year, another one. Those tires have to be on the pit wall or behind the pit wall before the car leaves the pit. That concern overtook what was the wrench in the window and a forgotten piece of the pit stop. Well, and obviously, as soon as that car drop down uh, I mean Kevin just left let's give you an idea of what's happened so far start of the race Zach Niesner number 42 into the early lead not too far after that a huge cut on Belage on the front straight number of cars involved you can see it a big pack up cars airborne a little bit later on the number 17 of Garvey and 20 Scott Legacy the rookie look what happens here on board with Garvey a little tap Garvey goes around pretty hard smack he is done, parked behind the wall. Then, young Joey Miller, so spectacularly wild last year, so brilliant today, makes the pass on Travis Kittleson and moves into the lead. And Rob Albright, he has been absolutely rock solid today. Well, the guy who's really been rock solid has been this crew chief, Bon Suss, for Joey Miller. Joey was leading comfortably, Bon, and appeared to be pulling away, yet you brought him in for left side tires. No chassis adjustments, it would appear. What's the thought process? No, the lefts will probably make us a little bit tighter, but we uh, got another set of rights here. I think a lot of guys are out of tires. This double file deal, I think it's worth saving some tires for the end, and we got we got 70 laps left, so it's a plenty long race. Joey's doing a fantabulous job. Donnie Reaver spotting for us is doing an awesome job, and these guys are getting some killer pit stops on the Great Clips Monte Carlo. Okay, are you saying you definitely plan to bring him in yet again for right sides, or are you just going to kind of wait and see how the cautions fall? We'll see what happens. They're in the bank. If we need to use them, we can go get them. A lot of other guys don't have that option. If we get a, you know, a good draw on this double file deal, get out front, maybe we won't need to come back in. So we'll see what happens. Interesting strategy, gentlemen. Fantabulous, as a matter of fact. I like that. By the way, our leader is Travis Kittleson and Jim Trado. Interesting strategy being played out there. You've got him on the radio. Travis Kittleson, Jim Trado in the Speed Channel booth. Do you copy? Four, Jim. You had a very serious incident there, nearly losing the car. You saved it with old tires. You changed right side tires about 25 laps ago. What is your strategy from here forward, now in the race lead? Uh, hopefully, you know, 70 laps to go, we can uh, hold the lead. Uh, I think that uh, we're weeding out some of the uh, accident prone deals, you know, and. Uh, I think that if it stays great, the Bob Steel Chevrolet car is going to stay under us, and uh, we'll be pretty good. 10 4 trap, good luck the rest of the way. Yep. Well, there you have it. He is uh, he is going to try to keep that car underneath him and uh, seems fairly confident. There is Jay Middleton, guy with a great program and a lot of uh, a lot of promise. Not going to happen today. Fans, they come in all ages and sizes here in Lakeland. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Lakeland, Florida, folks. There is a look inside the uh, mobile really studio and that is a very dedicated speed channel crew some of the top people in the business doing the business here 
And uh, we want to remind you some more business. It's NBS 24-7. Coming up Monday, 8 p.m., it's a behind-the-scenes look from the weekend's checkered flag to the next weekend's green through the week. So look at the real world of the NASCAR Bush Series. Follows drivers Casey Atwood, Casey Kahn, Tim Fedewa, and, of course, David Stremme, who is one of the ASA alumni, Rookie of the Year here in 02. There are others who are having a pretty good uh, career. We mentioned Stremme right there. How about Johnny Sauter, 10th in the standings? He was ASA's 2001 champion. Tim Fedewa, 91, Rookie of the Year in ASA. And Kyle Busch, currently 12th in the standings, finished 8th in the 2002 points chase. So we got some uh, great great uh, people to be following that really made their name right here in ASA. Guy who is a legend at ASA is on the radio with Jim Trado. Well, thanks to Racing Electronics. We'll catch up with Butch Miller. Hey, Butch Miller, we really are worried about those restarts. What have, your, what have been uh, your close calls or your thoughts on this choose rule this year? Well, you know, I'm an old-time racer, and, uh, you know, I like the old-fashioned single-file restarts, but you know what? I think it's best for the fans, and I'm going to live with it. Now, Butch, early on, it seemed to help you immensely get track position by using the outside line. Is the outside almost the preferred line at this point with the track conditions they, as they are? You know, sometimes it is because, uh, uh, you know, we're still learning about this. This is really new. But it seems like if, if a one-lap car gets on the inside, he can, and he usually stays down, he'll slow that inside line up. But I would think that if it was all fast cars, the preferred line would still be the inside. All right, but you had better tire wear than anyone else last year. How do you think your chances are in these final laps? Well, we're going to go racing here, but we'll see. You know, I, I don't know. We put it a little earlier this year than we have in the past, and uh, we'll just see what happens. We're going to do our best. And, by the way, man, it's a, I forgot to mention Timberwolf. We're glad to have him back this year. Ted for Butch. Thanks. Down to Rob Albright. Dean Roberts, sometimes adversity can lead to triumph. Can you take this backup car with no practice and put it in victory lane with your young driver? Yeah, I'll tell you, the car has been really good tonight. We've had a lot of trouble. Um, the uh, the Havlin target, Dodge, we're glad to put a Dodge up front, first of all, and especially for Chip Ganassi and them. And, uh, but we prepared the car. We've tested it. We knew the car should be okay, but uh, we've worked the bugs out of it. I think it's, it's good to go tonight. We, we should be in good shape. We'll let Gene go back to work as he spots from on top of the toolbox for his young driver, guys. And we are green. Kittleson with Miller alongside. Kittleson moves into the lead. Miller tucks in behind. And that was that paid off as he got by Sorensen. Sorensen actually dropping his spot as the number 42 of Niesner officially on the scoring monitor able to pick up third. And we're yellow, and it is Niesner. Wade Day just gently gets into him, but the front end of Niesner's car pretty well wrecked. Zach could not lock it down again. The pole winner who got a little loose earlier in the race gave up the race lead. He's been mired really out of sequence with the lead cars to this point. And a rough debut for the Wood Brothers racing car, but again, Zach, again, eight starts last year, was a teammate that Butch Miller had some great runs and got some great education working with such a great veteran driver, Butch Miller, a three-time series champion. We just spoke with him on the radio. Butch Miller went to the outside on that restart and claimed second pretty quickly. No, it was very effective for him, uh, without a doubt. You know, another guy that's very impressive, number 35, Doug Stevens, is now fourth in this one with the number five of Rick Beebe, who is one of the very savviest of veterans, uh, has had a great car and has come up into the fifth spot. There is a look now at the front end of Wade Day's medicine shop Chevy. And obviously, he's got a little bit of damage, uh, a lot of areas on that car. There is a look at the number five, uh, Collis Equipment Structural Transport and Redline Oil Ford of Rick Beebe, who is having himself a very impressive run. There's Niesner's car. We're going to go back now, Jim, and take a look at uh, what happened out there and uh, just watch for Niesner. Right here on the inside is the uh, Terry's Automotive Ford of, of the uh, 71 of Sontag. He clipped the right side. Ooh, hard impact. That was there. Miller. Clipped the right side of the 42 of Niesner, sending him into the wall as he came back down, clipped again, and Wade Day stopped at the door panel. And I think that was Joey Miller that hit him pretty solidly. There's Scott Isaacs, the safety director on the scene, and chatting right now with, with Niesner. But uh, tell you what, Joey Miller, who uh, very curious as to what kind of situation his car is in at this stage as well. Well, Niesner got sent up the racetrack for the wall impact, then really got tagged hard as his car came across the racetrack. And, 22-year-old youngster is going to feel it tomorrow. Hopefully he's okay right now as uh, Zach's being attended to by ASA Safety Director Scott Isaacs, a full-time traveling EMT fireman from Indianapolis. In that replay, did you get a sense that maybe Sontag just tapped 
his left rear corner and just unloaded it and sent him right to the wall? It looked like it may have been a wheel knock, like the, right. the wheels touched each other, taking the wheel out of the hand of Zach Niesner, sending him up the wall, uh, up the racetrack. And Sontag has had a fast race car all night. Let's take one more look. Here they are paired up right there as they enter the corner. Look on the right-hand side of your screen. It looks like Sontag's all the way to the apron, almost down to the bottom. Niesner yeah. gets high-sided almost as he hits the wall. But as, it, as Niesner comes down the banking, we're keeping our eyes open here for the hard impact of Joey Miller. That was the 15 car that started wow. the sixth position. See Gary Sherman once again in there and Wade Day. It could have been a lot worse, believe it or not. Missed debris up here. Thanks to the spotters and that audible alert system. When the caution's out, the drivers hear it in their headset. A little tone goes off. Yep. They're able to slow up and not cause further damage. Boy, they're doing some serious chatting with these. That hit with Miller on the driver's side may have rattled him just a little bit. And for, for Sontag, I have to say, it looked to me, actually, that maybe Niesner came down a little bit, and that was where the contact happened. But right there is the number 15 of Miller, and it just ripped the door right off the car. But otherwise, the car doesn't look too bad. These are fiberglass bodies. Again, the panels are made by a spec company. Five Star Stock Car Bodies makes every race body used in ASA. Fiberglass panels, we get a nice look at the, would that be the doggy cam that's got a little more air going toward it as he, uh, this is a vent to get air into the cockpit. That's no longer an issue. There's a lot of air coming in. Uh, that, yeah, that car is breathing just fine. And there is Niesner getting a little help. I think he may have been, been shaken up just a smidge, and he's getting some help up by the track rescue team here. And, of course, Scott Isaacs of ASA, the safety director, overseeing everything down there, doing a great job, as always. Talking a little bit about Rick Beebe. Sits in fifth in the number five. Uh, Collis Equipment, Redline Oil, Ford. And I'll tell you, this is a guy who has been around for a long time. And his views on what the season holds in terms of what he's looking forward to, Something to very much pay attention to. Well, you know, I'm looking forward to this double foul restart choose rule with mixed emotions. Could be hard on race cars, but man, it's got to be great for the fans. Earlier this afternoon, in support of the ASA race here, one of Florida's most popular series, the Fast Truck Series, put on a great show right at the start. A good move. There's the number six of David Poland. Worked his way up to the front. Lots of incidents, including one driver on the roof. But at the end of it all, Poland ended up taking home the big trophy. Now, they have a junior division of racing here. This, by the way, is a young driver, 15 years old, finished fifth in the fast truck race. And this is the junior division champion of the winter series. Happens to be a guy named Mark Martins, young son. What? A great ride for him. Matt Martin hold that trophy over his head. Still wasn't six feet tall. This kid's right. got it going on. He's running a full-size truck now. We talked about Joey Miller and getting into Niesner after Niesner rebounded off of the wall. We have that from on board. Our tape crew doing a phenomenal job. We're going to play that for you real time, and we're going to lay out because we want you to just to listen because you get a sense of how good that hit is. Niesner, by the way, has been removed into the ambulance, simply precautionary, and we're on board here now with Joey. Uh, uh, as they're lapping around, you can see that uh, contact did loosen up the front of the uh, of the hood there without question, along with some damage to the door panel. But from the onboard, when we get that uh, all set up for you, it is absolutely amazing. Check this out. And the amazing thing is, uh, from what we understand, the car seems to be tracking pretty well. It's missing the door, hood is loose, but uh, he doesn't even stop. Car just continues to circulate around the track. So just amazing. Uh, again, the strength of these ASA cars is really something impressive. And keep in mind that fiberglass door bolts right onto the uh, car on the, on the side of the uh, body. It's all seam fitted on the inside. That door peels away. He did not have to make a pit stop to repair any sheet metal damage. These panels are made to come off in sections or put back on in sections as the nose is all one piece, the hood, of course, and everything else. It doesn't take an $8,000 budget and a body man right. to make these bodies. These are all cast spec bodies by five star stock car bodies and he's still up at the eighth spot meanwhile back in 14th his teammate defending champion kevin sawinski and let's go down to his pit with ken stout yeah you know guys i was standing here and all of a sudden mike jabby flew down off of the pit box and ran over to garvey's pit and had a little discussion with shane tesh what's going on mike well we kind of received word through the grapevine down here that uh Janet king bunch is mad at us because they think that we caused the wreck and uh you know the replay on tv clearly showed that you know, it was somebody else that took him out. So 
We're actually kind of hoping that you TV guys could do us a favor, and if you'd replay it, uh, Shane said he's going to watch it. But uh, Kevin radioed in that we almost got wrecked, too, because Cope got into him. So, I mean, Mike Garvey's a great racer. We wouldn't do anything like that intentional. Kevin doesn't race that way at lap 35. And we just don't want to get wrecked. Let's go to Rub. Well, Joey Miller is going to come on pit road. It looks like it'll be at least one tire and some cosmetic work. Bon Suss feels like the damage may be superficial, just as you guys had observed. You can see the guys are ready to go, just awaiting their young driver, who just a few moments ago was leading this race and pulling away. They brought him on pit road to change left side tires. He ended up deep in the back, and that may be what caused him to be involved in that incident. It is going to be right side tires for Joey Miller. They're not doing any chassis adjustments whatsoever, so that reinforces our conviction that probably the damage they believe does not affect the chassis whatsoever. A lot of tape going on the right front corner of that automobile, and Joey Miller will be down on the way very, very shortly. He's really not in jeopardy of losing a lap as they keep him on pit road, keep the jack under the car. When it drops, that will be his signal to take off. You can see this 200 mile an hour tape in spades coming out for the right side of this race car. There's only so much they can do. They cannot completely replace that right side door panel, guys. You can see it from your perspective in the booth. We can't from down on pit road. Guys, well, the other thing that's interesting with the five max, oh, and he stalled it, now he goes. The five maximum over the wall rule, you see the creativity, the long pole to clean the rubber and debris out of the radiator and let's to keep those cars working. You maximize the opportunities. We'll be back. Welcome back. We've just restarted with less than 50 laps to go here in Lakeland. Enjoy the sounds of speed. Sawinski, the country Joe Holmes, Chevrolet, the defending champion, and uh, he's able to grab a gear and take off again. Number 57, Sherman involved once again, and uh, the guy who uh, suffered uh, the most up there, I believe, is number eight, that Chris Stump, who may have been involved, but uh, Sawinski, uh, boy, I'll tell you, his day has gone from good to bad to, to worse as uh, he's trying to do something. Let's go back and uh, take a look at what caused this one. Just back to green, Travis Kittleson's on the bottom of that black and silver. No, it's actually Tim Russell, the Florida rookie, getting into the one of Kevin Sawinski. They entered the corner almost three wide there. The black car on the bottom again, Tim Russell, just nudging Kevin Sawinski and spinning out the two-time champ. I said Chris Stump, the other car involved with 96 Wade Day, uh, who uh, just grazed the wall, uh, taking a defensive posture right there to try and avoid everything that happened. So Kowinski, as I said, his day is plummeting in a big hurry right now that takes him uh, back officially at this point according to scoring to the 17th place meanwhile on that restart I, uh, we really need to point out Doug Stevens boy is he playing the chess game beautifully here as we take a look at day you see him weaving back and forth trying to make sure that car is all right but that green number 35 of Stevens the Shadow Rock properties and Conkley's tub grinding machine uh, he has played it beautifully went to the outside and uh, from fourth and immediately ended up dropping into second with Miller third, BB fourth, and 29, Reed Sorensen, which I think is a tremendous story simply for the fact that, as we said, that car had two laps on it uh, before this race started. They were the qualifying laps, and they somehow have been able throughout this race to massage that car into a very, very fast race car right now. Meanwhile, we're talking about Sawinski's problems back in 17. Well, Jim's got him on the radio. Well, Kevin, this is the first race of the year. A lot of anticipation, a lot of adrenaline. You don't often spin, much less get help. To, uh, tell us your thoughts on that spin and what all transpired there, Kev. I think the 36 car just got a little bit uh, overzealous. We were going by him on the outside, and I don't know if he could keep it down or what, but got into the left rear corner of us, turned us around. It's a shame we got a great race car. Sir, Kev. We're getting the one to green, Kevin. We'll get you back to business and appreciate your time. Kevin Swinski joining us on the radio. And Really looking at the veterans that have been behind the pit wall. This is a huge deal for Kevin Switzky to get maximum points out of here. We had 
uh, Robbie Pyle behind the wall. We've had a lot of other cars. My, Brian Ruffner, Tim Sauter, guys we thought would contend for the win. Mike Garvey has spent numerous laps behind the wall. It's huge in the points. If right. Swinsky gets a good finish out of this one. Well, and you remember when we went to break and we had his bump about what he was looking forward to, he said the juice rule. He said because of putting strategy. He okay. just, without a question, went to the outside. He wants to do whatever he can to uh, late the race here and move up to that 17th spot. We are green. You heard the call. And it's going to be Kittleson bringing him up. Miller went to the outside, promptly goes by the 35. And Doug Stevens picks up that spot. The question is, where is the number one of Sawinski? And does he move up a little bit? Well, officially at the line, he jumped three spots. We have to see where everything settles out. There he is. Uh, and he's got, uh, well, his teammate, Joey Miller, right in front of him on the outside. And we'll see if he stays high or drops low. He goes up high, going around Day. Then the 57 of Sherman. He got help there because Sherman just hasn't been that quick. And uh, he read that beautifully. We go on board. Joey Miller, the great clip. Monte Carlo looking back at his teammate Sawinski as they now are augering up through the pack. And that is, uh, well, Sawinski shown in 15th. See Tim Sauter just ahead in that Lester building's black and white number nine. Again, he spent many laps behind the wall. Certainly a contender hoping he'd get a better run here. And Swenski really working his way well through the field. And without that door on his teammate's car ahead, doesn't seem to bother Joey Miller in that black and blue number 15 car. Nope, Joey moves around number eight to McDonald's car. Chris Stump and bringing Sawinski right with him. They're already now in uh, 11th and 12th respectively. So they are marching toward the front. And uh, there's still some racing to go. I mean, we've got 162 laps officially complete, but uh, we've seen things change up uh, drastically in a lot less laps than that. We've seen Tim Russell just ahead of these two. I wonder if Russell will get away from Sawinski as Sawinski again uh, got spun around just a moment ago under green by the car he's about to encounter here, the 36 of Tim Russell. Number nine, number 36, the Chevrolet ahead of that Florida rookie. Boy, and look at Sawinski trying to use Russell as a pick, and it worked. He got underneath Joey. Oh, Joey loose. Big save, but the back end stepped out, and that allowed Sawinski to get by clean. Now he cuts underneath the number 36 of Russell, and Sawinski is on the fly. Look at him bobbing, <laughs> weaving through traffic. Joey Miller, a big squeeze play. And hey, the right side's damaged anyway. Grind more of it off if you have to getting up to the pack as he's squeezed by Russell. But look how much distance opened up there. Just a nudge by Joey Miller opens up the 10 car length advantage by Kevin Sawinski, one of the fastest cars in the racetrack. As uh, again, just some more body parts flying off just ever so slight that Joey Miller's great clip Chevy. Well, remember when we went back to green, Sawinski was 17th, he's now 11th and uh, is closing up quickly. The number 24 of Rich Locke would be the next guy that he goes by. Keeping an eye here on Joey Miller's progress as well as he's just, uh, what the heck, roughhousing it up to the pack right now. And we move up just a little bit. There's the number two of Chad Wood right behind him, the number four of the Sitco Chevy of Stephen Light. That's the battle for eighth yeah. position. And really, Stephen Light's been kind of silent. He qualified second, dropped back to fourth or fifth, and now into that veteran leadership of Howie Leto in the hunt again as he's trying to pull even with veteran Chad Wood. Boy, was that a nice move as he came off and turn four and just drove down underneath. Not a bad move for a 17-year-old kid looking for rookie of the year run oh, here. I'll tell you, he is really good. Now he comes out of four down the front straight. And uh, Ken Stout, number two, Wood has been competitive all day, but boy, he just gave one up to uh, Stephen Light. because it seems like it's working out pretty doggone good for him, Rob. Probably, Ken, the most coveted ride for a rookie driver was this Waltom ride as a teammate to Robbie Pyle this season. In fact, Stephen Light was the survivor of several tests that included a total of, I believe, either five or six young drivers. So he really has faced as much pressure just getting this ride as he probably all will, as he probably will this season in trying to run competitively, guys. Well, Rob, I think that's fairly interesting because uh, to have gone through that kind of pressure when you get into the race, you've already dealt with a lot of pressure, and uh, obviously that might make the season a little bit. Oh, look at the close action here. That is Greg Stewart trying to duck underneath Brett Sontag and move up. Now, keep in mind, Sontag is down a lap, so Stewart and Sontag floats up high, opens the door, lets Stewart through, and Light looks like he's going to follow him through. That's one great thing about the ASA National Tour. You mentioned Kevin Swinsky. Did he want payback? Did he want vindication on the 36 car? No, he didn't. 
Greg Stewart there racing very close quarters, both giving an inch, no rubbing to get a pass done. That's why ASA is some of the best short track racers in the country. And they're showing it right here, and there is a look at the Bob Steele Chevrolet crew. That is the crew of our leader, Travis Kittleson, second in the rookie chase last year, on his way to his first win. Welcome back to the SK Hand Tool 200 here at USA International Speedway in Lakeland, Florida. 177 laps complete. We're under caution once again. The 86 of Jeff Streeter, and it really was just Jeff. It just got around on him coming out of turn four, and he looped it just a graze of the wall on the infield. But right before that happened, as you see, we have a new leader. His name, Butch Miller, the Timberwolf Chevrolet. And uh, here's how it happened, and he hounded number 30, Kittleson, and finally just got underneath him. Off of turn number two, just the prior corner, Kittleson got a little bit loose, allowing the bottom to open up. Butch Miller, textbook pass. Kittleson can do nothing but watch that one. This caution may help Kittleson regain some life in those BF yeah. Rich tires if he has any wear problems. Butch Miller again, smooth on the gas, smooth on the brake. One of the best guys when it comes to tire wear. May have the advantage here for a repeat at Lakeland. Now there is Travis Kittleson, the Bob Steele Chevrolet, who's in second. And as you said, this caution may have been great timing for them. Rob Albright might have the answer. Well, we'll ask Gary Crooks, the crew chief for Travis Kittleson. Gary, this restart rule, the choose rule, is that going to affect now where Travis lines up on this restart? And will he have a chance on that restart to maybe retake the lead? Well, you know, the Bob Steele Chevrolet Easy Care Monte Carlo is running awful good, and I don't know if we get inside 20 to go, they won't restart that way. It'll be single pile anyway. Uh, I think Travis and Butch will put on, a, put on a great race. We're getting a little loose the longer we run. Uh, we got 20 laps left, tires cool down. We'll be able to race them pretty hard. That was my second question to you was, will the cooler tires maybe work to Travis's advantage on a restart? I believe they will. I think uh, if we're going to get him, it's going to be at the beginning of this, this run. Well, everybody expected, guys, Travis to win last year. He hasn't won a race yet, but maybe this one will happen tonight for him. And Gary Crooks, I believe, grew up 20 minutes away from the late Scott Frazier. Certainly wants to win this race in the memory of his old friend. Here's the car, by the way, in third, Doug Stevens, who has just driven an absolutely brilliant race and has been in that top five pretty much uh, the latter half of this race. And right behind him is Reed Sorensen. That is the Dodge, sponsored by Target and Haviland. And uh, that, that team has done a brilliant job. Uh, and look at the back-to-back uh, -back rookie champ, national champ, and uh, Mark Martin, Sawinski. Can Sorensen do it? I think he's got the talent. Mark Martin was here earlier tonight to allow uh, to be part of his son's uh, celebration of winning that winter series in the juniors in the fast truck division. He was handing out some trophies. I don't know if he's still here, but I, I would think if he stuck around for the first part of the race, it's hard to miss the finish. Because yeah. uh, Reed Sorensen broke Mark's record as the youngest rookie ever in ASA. Certainly a young driver. Chip Ganassi has already tapped him to a contract, a personal services contract. He's running the full season this year in the Target Haviland Dodge. They brought in veteran leadership with Gene Roberts. We've already talked to him tonight. That team's just really got it together. Now, you heard them talking about the fact that uh, that we're going to be in the last 20 laps. It's a single file restart. The choose rule is gone. And uh, what will happen is all the lap cars will drop back to the back. It'll be lead lap cars battling from this point on on the restart. So it simplifies things just a little bit, which certainly might help out uh, Butch in the sense that he now does not have to worry about somebody on his outside or inside, depending upon where he would have gone in trying to make this happen. But for Kittleson, uh, this is uh, he's going to have to figure something out. Meanwhile, Ken Stout is down in Butch Miller's pit. Oh, well, Dion, it looks like this thing's coming to you guys. You said you've been working seven days a week for the past few months. Capped it off with a long ride to Florida, but it looks like it's all going to be worth it if you can hang on to this spot. I'll tell you what, how about that Butch Miller? He just waits around and waits around. When it's time to go, it's time to go. We had a great Timberwolf Chevy today. Uh, I can't say enough about these guys. We've been working hard for two months, and this is how it works. We win races. Excellent job. These guys are definitely on a roll, man. Look out for Butch Miller at the end of a race. I tell you, when it comes down to strategy and execution late in the going, especially, nobody's better. He's proven that uh, over the years. I mean, he holds the record in uh, all-time polls, but he's also second in the win list, I believe. And I uh, tell you what, that doesn't happen by uh, just being lucky. There you take a look at Look at the lap leaders right there. Eddie gone. I mean, he's led so many. <laughs> but Butch Miller, second in the all-time career lap leaders. And the thing for Butch, he's led a lot of those final laps. And uh, that is pretty important as well. So uh, Butch in a good place here, but Travis Kittleson 
Well, what a run Travis has put on. Definitely a well earned run by Butch Miller. And Travis Kisson is still in the learning process. Again, he ran a lot of short track races in Florida. Really a standout when it comes to the best of the best. They call it Speed Weeks. The month of February is really when the late model drivers all show up from around the country. Even Canada, Junior Hanley comes down and races in Florida. Travis beat these guys at their best yep. a couple years back, and he certainly turned a lot of attention towards ASA and focused on that. But he still plays around as a late model and uh, certainly had Pete Orr, the late Pete Orr, helping him in his early stages. So it's going to be neat to see Kittleson mature here in his oh, second year at ASA. And he is quick, without a doubt. Now, here's the interesting thing for me. This guy is in fifth. He, too, has put on a great drive. The four cars in front of him absolutely covered sponsor decals. But this guy, Casey Smith, look at how empty that car is, and that's almost a crime. He has driven such a brilliant race. The number 19 out of Austin, Texas. Uh, the left-hander chassis is the only really sponsored decal he's carrying right now. And uh, this guy has just been brilliant in that Smith Racing Dodge needs to get some sponsorship to really uh, bring this to fruition. What a great race. And indeed, as we get the uh, signal that the caution lights continue to stay out, one more lap away. It was alluded to by Gary Crooks, the crew chief for Travis Kittleson. Yep. ASA has made a rule. They are going to larger tracks this year, but they've made a rule on restarts. Any track under a mile in length, the last 20 laps, they're going to have a lead lap cars to line up single file and race it out. On larger tracks than a mile, they're going to go the last 10 laps or so and single file those cars on the restart when they get back to green. And keep in mind, every ASA race ends under a green flag. The last five laps have to be under the green flag. That is going to be fascinating to watch. You see Joey Miller in. He had a tire cut down from some of the body work. They've got that fixed. Here are your top ten. We're closing in on the last 16 laps. Welcome back. We have just gone back to green here at USA International Speedway. 188 laps in the books. 12 to go. Butch Miller leads it, but Travis Kittleson is right there and has, in fact, closed it up all over Miller. He looks to the inside, going down into turn three. Miller not giving him any opening. Kittleson right there. I was watching Kittleson very closely in practice, and he got on the throttle really aggressively mid-corner earlier than a lot of people. Sometimes that means he's not carrying much speed into the turn. That's not the case. Kittleson is just flat fast right now. If Butch Miller can hold him off just for two more laps, I think Miller has the tire advantage. Butch, however, is not keeping those left side tires on the yellow line, at least he did in the last lap. Travis Kittleson really doesn't have an option right now. He's got to follow Butch as these tires re-warm up to that 200 plus degree temperature as they get through this cycle. Butch Miller has the advantage and the experience here to perhaps hold off this uh, driver looking for his first win. Kittle. Oh, and we just had a big pass here as uh, that is the battle going on. And look at this, the number four, Stephen Light ducks underneath the number 19. Uh, Smith drops him down a spot. Maybe, no, no contact. Ken Stout, number 19, looks to be in trouble. All night long. One of the things I've been fighting all night long, guys, is Casey Smith lost power steering very early on in this race. Those arms have to be getting tired. Oh, that explains a lot, absolutely, especially in traffic. You can't get the move done as abruptly as you want. Joey Miller back in the pits. Huge problems now have developed with that car. There is the number five. That is Beebe in seventh, 33, Stewart in eighth, and number one, Sawinski picking his way up to the front in ninth. That is how a champion deals with adversity. You pick up as many spots as you can. You may not have a shot at winning, but if you, if you get eighth instead of ninth, you take those points and make it happen. He is doing everything he can right now. Seven laps officially left to go. Certainly on the button here, Sawinski again inside that top ten. It's somehow a magical way to finish. You want to get a top ten run after the spin. He was back to 17, so a great charge by the two-time champ and defending champ in the series. And looking at how these cars are running right now, Rick Beebe has settled into a really strong run as well. And Kittleson just hounding Miller right now as they work by the lap car damage car, Refner. Kittleson giving Miller absolutely no quarter. They've opened up uh, over a second lead now on the 35 of Doug Stevens. Stevens has another half a second back to 29 Sorensen and then the number four of rookie Stephen Light. But they got to be impressed right now with, with what Kittleson's doing against a master tire strategist. And we knew <laughs> Kittleson's tires weren't great. This kid is driving the wheels and the heart out of that car right now. And there is concern in Butch Miller's pit because this team is not anywhere close to what they thought would be a four or five or six car like the Vantage Kittleson 
really has been staying close to Butch Miller's rear bumper. Well, five laps to go, and the caution comes out. I believe, Jim, that uh, scoring will stop scoring laps until we go back to the green. So we should have five laps to go, and you can see Day has gone into the wall, and because the car has suddenly stopped and it's running warm, he's uh, spewing some uh, coolant right now out of the engine at this stage, but uh, more concern is back into the wall. Wade Day still in his car. Again, this uh, car was put together last year. Chad Orr was working with Gary St. Amant for Bob Harshberger and the Medicine Shop Chevy team. They made some changes in the offseason. Wade Day gets the nod from fellow Tennessean Bob Harshberger. He had a great run, led some laps, and unfortunately his day ends against the fence. All right, and this is going to set up something fascinating because, uh, again, Kittleson, Obviously, anytime he cool those tires off, it looks like it's awfully effective. Meanwhile, here's Casey Smith. He, too, was one of the drivers we asked, what are you looking forward to this season? Oh, man, ASA is real tough this year. We pretty much proved Tim Sauter's back, and uh, I'm looking forward to the speedways, and uh, I'm looking forward to all year being a rookie and, and learning a lot with Joe Shear's help. Welcome back. This is Kyle Jennings, a Dark Horse rec recording artist, and he came all the way from Nashville, Tennessee, brought his band with him to entertain here at uh, USA International Speedway during the autograph session and the like. Uh, just an absolutely great group, by the way. Here you see number 96, Wade Day, getting out of the car, looking okay, looking the car over. By the way, coming up Tuesday, 7.30 p.m., Sports Car Revolution, an absolute must for the sports car enthusiast. You can improve your technique from the track to the street. If you own a sports car, you need to check out Sports Car Revolution, Tuesday, 7.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Right there, that is the trophy that is going to be handed out here. Now, of course, Butch had that last year. He wants it back, but Travis Kittleson, and I got to wonder, I mean, this this long caution has got to be doing wonders for Kittleson's tires. Of course, it isn't going to be hurting Butch's either. This could be a great shootout. You know, it, ASA always attracts the best of the best short track racers. Yep. Travis Kittleson just down the road cut his teeth at Orlando Speed World, 2000 Series track champion there. If he wins tonight, this would be the biggest homecoming win for Travis. Yeah. Born in Wisconsin, but really a Florida driver. And yep. number 30 on his door, uh, the legendary Pete Orr shared that number for many years. A Florida veteran, a master, many-time champion, certainly an inspiration to uh, to Travis. So not only is he trying to drive the wheels off for his family to score their first win in the series, but I'm sure this win would be great in his home state. Let's not forget Reed Sorensen, as we show you the top 10 here, in fourth, he has shown the ability to move up on every restart, and Stephen Light has been very quick as well. So that's the situation right there, and uh, we are going to be watching this restart again. Five lap shootout to the end. And Butch Miller hoping to hold on. Travis Kittleson hoping to get that first ever win. We're going to find out how it comes out in just a minute. We are back. USA International Speedway, the SK Hand Tools 200, uh, just about to conclude this first race of the season. And we're going to do a pit whip around and talk about our top four drivers. Let's start it off, Ken Stout. Yeah, of course, spoke to Dion. I said, what's the strategy? He says to stay out in front. He says, we're going to give him a lesson in defensive driving, Rob. It's good news, bad news for Travis Kittleson. Good news, the tires are cooler. Bad news, he doesn't have the right transmission for a great restart he'll have to anticipate. Ken? Doug Stevens looking to hang in there tight. Crew chief Brett Reagan. Those guys have worked together in a couple top threes, a couple top fives in Arca. This is no strange position for them. You think with the day Reed Sorensen has had in a backup car, they'd be content with fourth. Not so. They want to try to get the third spot on this restart in the final five laps, guys. And, of course, Stephen Light sitting in fifth. Hope they all take each other out. He comes weeding through the debris and picks up the big win. I think Light is the X Factor. He picked up two yeah. spots on the last restart. Got by Rick Beebe. Got by Casey Smith. Keep your eyes on that red wall town number four coming through. Here we go. We are back to green. Five lap shootout to the finish. We complete lap 196 as we come by Miller, Kettleson, 35, Stevens, 29, Sorensen, and four light. Light right up underneath Sorensen, closest to the battles, right there. Number four, the Waltham Sitco Chevy, right there, closing it up. Sorensen now coming after Stevens. Sorensen, the target, Haviland Dodge. Stevens coming up right there, that is the Shadow Rock Chevy. That is your best battle up front. Again, Miller and Kittleson driving away. Kittleson hounding 
Miller coming off the turns. This is the battle for the lead. I'd say he anticipated that restart beautifully, but there goes Butch making the Timberwolf uh, Sparky's Food Store Chevy real wide right now. And Kittleson is looking for any opportunity. The problem is, you don't see Butch make a lot of mistakes out there. Let the back end float out, give you the opening. You're going to have to get creative and find something and uh, really try and force your way by. Those two are gone. And uh, watching this, but uh, how's that battle going on behind them? There's been a good battle there, too. Watching these guys when we come around. We're on the final lap. Last lap. There it is, Miller, Kettleson, look at the battle behind them. Sorensen, he is third. Light is fourth. We're missing Stevens completely. He's dropped off the radar. Now we are on our final lap. Five laps to the end. Light trying to get underneath Sorensen. Sorensen driving him as hard as he can around the outside. Look at the margin already, almost two and a half seconds. Second to third. Light still working, Sorensen. Here we go, final turn. Miller hangs on. Butch repeats here in Lakeland and at the line. It's Light. Then it is Sorensen and then Miller. No, check that. That is 19. Casey Smith able to come up and hang on to that fifth spot. And here's just a quick note for you folks. Seventh spot, Kevin Sawinski. Talk about getting as many points as you can. Unbelievable job by Sawinski, but what a last five laps here at USA International Speedway for the opening round of the ASA Championship. We're going to be back and talk to our winner. We've talked to him so many times. Butch Miller will be with us when we return. Speed Channel's live coverage of the ASA Racing Series SK Hand Tool 200 has been brought to you by SK Hand Tool, professional tools since 1921. And by BF Goodrich Tires, the official tire of ASA. Welcome back, we are back and take a look at our top 10 here and what a remarkable last five lap shootout. In fact, the entire race, phenomenal. Miller gets the win, Kittleson so close once again and Jim called it. Steven Light, what a rocket at the end up into third. You take a look at the rest of the top 10. Let's get right down to winner's circle and a familiar face with Rob Albright. Well, you know, somebody a little more important than me has to get in there first, and that's Donna. <laughs> hey, Butch, you know, I've got short-term memory problems. I got grandkids like you, but it seems to me we did this exact same interview a year ago here. Oh, this is cool. I, I like doing this. You know, I, I had good news tonight because because uh, Mark Martin was here, you know, it, with Matt. He says he's coming to race ASA. So I'm hanging around for one or two more years <laughs> so I can race Mark and Matt. Well, how much did the uh, restart rule, the new choose rule, come into uh, your decisions on pit stops and where you chose for the restarts? And did that have an impact on who won the race tonight? I think it did. You know, it, it took everybody. Everybody's probably on an equal basis now. But in, in the beginning, nobody knew which lane to choose. And I think towards the end, they figured it out. And I think we've got it figured out, too. It's going to make for interesting racing. Well, Butch Miller marking himself as maybe the man that uh, everybody's going to chase for the championship this year. One young guy that's going to chase him all the way through the season is the guy that's standing by with Ken Stout. That's right, Robin. Five seems to be the number 50 for you. It's five here in the top five for Travis Kittleson. It'll match your best ever finish with ASA that you had at Concord last year with a second place finish. But talk to me about those last couple of laps, man. It must have been killing you. Uh, I was dying, you know, the car is really falling off on the long runs, uh, but it was excellent on the cold tires. I think Butch was just the opposite. Um, you know, I, I really wanted to prove to Butch that I could run clean. Uh, I think I did tonight. I showed a lot of patience. He, should, he opened the door for me a couple times getting into one. I could have stuck it in there, but it wouldn't have been pretty. But uh, I mean, the Bob Steele Chevrolet, Easy Care Monte Carlo was excellent. Uh, I got to thank Easy Care, uh, Bob Steele Chevrolet, Kevin Steele, the Steele family. Um, the car was great. I got to thank the guys. Awesome pit stop tonight. Congratulations to the kid. Back to Rob. Stephen Light came from very deep after his final pit stop to work his way get back up to third. Are you sure you're 17 years old? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I got to tell you, I got to thank this crew. Uh, I got to thank our sponsors, Sitco, Action Performance, uh, uh, Wall Tom Racing. I mean, for giving me this opportunity. And uh, I mean, early on, we uh, the car was real tight. Really couldn't do nothing with it. Just tried to hang in there for a little while while we made some stops. Tried to work on it. We made 
two or three adjustments in the very last stop when we put on left side tires. Howie, I don't know what call Howie made, but he made the right one, and, and that thing came out of the pitch just a rocket, and it was just it was awesome. The one real right call that Howie made was choosing this young man, Stephen Light, for his driver, guys. I think there's no question of that. You mentioned earlier, Rob, that he's the eyes are on him from NASCAR and Bush, and man, did he open them up. Here is our final official results for the entire field. An absolutely great race up front. Obviously, Joey Miller back there a little bit. Much better things. Robbie Pyle, Tim Sauter, uh, way in the back. Travis Dassau, Mike Garvey. I mean, a number of guys that could have been so much more into it had problems in the early going, and it really hurt them late in the running. But nonetheless, the the season is now underway. The gauntlets have been dropped. Butch Miller has shown once again the force he is going to be. And we get a little bit of a break before we go to the Great Oval in Lanier, Georgia. Looking forward to that in a little bit. It's been absolutely wonderful. Glad